Hey everyone, welcome back to Bridge Stories. You are listening to Season 2. If you're new to our podcast, this is our place where we just sit down and give people space and time to tell stories of how they've encountered God and been changed by Him. This season we're going to be sitting down with some familiar faces to many of you, and we hope that you'll get a little deeper glimpse into who they are and the things that God has brought them through. We're also excited to get to introduce you to some new people, some people with some incredible stories to share of how God has provided and encouraged them and helped them to live out a life of faith. We hope that these stories encourage you and challenge you in your faith as you walk closer to Jesus than ever before, as you seek him with all of your heart. So sit back and enjoy and be encouraged as you listen. With that, let's jump in. All right, here we go, season two. Krista, thanks for coming on. Um, I was driving in thinking uh, about you, and I was thinking, um, uh, like we were laughing before we just started, it's going to be hard to keep the, the train on the tracks. Um, I'll try. I feel like we know each other pretty well, and uh, I'd consider you a, a great friend, so I'm glad that you're here, and I'm excited to jump in and uh, hopefully give people an idea of who you are, maybe in some ways I, I know about you that... Um, just make people love you more than they already do. Thank so you. Um, as we jump in, uh, kind of start the same way. Let's just talk about you. Where'd you come from? Um, and we'll just tell the long roundabout story to how you landed here, and then we'll talk about um, the present. So Wild. Yeah. Tell us. Okay, well, first and foremost, I just want you to know, I knew nothing about podcasts until you. Really? Yeah, remember? So we used to have a, a text between you, Eric, and I, and it was called the Podcast Rebels. You don't. Rem- I have it still to this day. I mean, I knew we had a text. I didn't know it was called the podcast. <laughs> Rebels. Rebels. She must have named it. I would never call myself that. I think you did. I swear. <laughs> I wouldn't have called myself a rebel, but well, we weren't doing anything rebelly, but it was just funny because we were like literally on like the the podcast, like every like one that we can listen to and just like inundate all this information. That was funny. So just FYI, I would have never known about a podcast if it wasn't for Andy here. I do remember like five or six years ago, it was so easy to find podcasts. Mm-hmm. Now there's so many, it's like impossible to, to find even what you're looking for sometimes. Yeah. And I remember like going just down deep dives to like, Oh, and then this one said about this podcast, and you're just like adding more podcasts to your day. So there you go. Thank you for the podcast immersion course years ago. Now you're on one. No, but <laughs> wild. Anyways. Okay, so um, I come from a bigger family, um, small knit home, so we're very, very, very close. Tell people what you mean by larger family. Um, so I have five brothers and two sisters, and then, of course, my mom and dad, and we lived in a two-bedroom home. Um, so with one bath, shower, one other bathroom, but yeah, so I never, like we shared a lot of space. So, um, but my dad did own his own company. Um, so I think the majority of us out of eight of us, we all have some type of our own company that we do. So I'm, I'm going to say my dad probably was, you know, when you see what a parent does, you follow. So I think we were all inspired by him owning his own business. Where so. did you fall in the birth order? I'm a middle child, if you can believe it or not. <laughs> and it's so funny because I always tell my siblings, I know everything above me and everybody, everything below me because I was in the middle. So I'm always like, I have the years, the dates, the music that was playing. Like, it's funny. So so. I'm a middle child too. What does middle child mean to you? What was kind of like your, your personality developed? Well, okay. So mine was fight or flight for sure because I was closest to my brothers. My sisters were older than me. So I tend to be a, kind of getting in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I wasn't like over for sure. Like most middle children, they're like, oh, poor things. They don't have a voice. I had a very big voice. Where Where um, did you grow up? I grew up in Norwalk. Norwalk. Mm-hmm. In town. Is that what they call it? That's just Norwalk. It is it. Norwalk. <laughs> it's right next to um, Cerritos and Bellflower. So yeah. we're a little sandwiched in between those two. And what was what was kind of your childhood like? What was the, the world like for Krista as a child? You know, unfortunately, um, I have to tell you, I my childhood was very non-realistic. My mom and dad were very, very close. There was no fighting with my mom and dad. Um, they loved each other. They they became, they were first in their lives, not us. So because they were first, we knew there was a major great security in that. Um, so I thought everybody had that. I didn't know um, that people didn't have that. So when you get married, you think, oh, your husband's going to be just like your dad. And you're like, oh, he's still not like my dad. 
So is there like an as- assumption that if you get married, that you just kind of, it just falls into place like and that's how it is? Yes. Not like you got to work for it or it's no. hard work. Just you get married and no. that's just how it is. Because I, my mom and dad really never made it look like work, I think. Mm. That was the problem. But my, they were very, they were a team unit. So um, we definitely knew that they were first. My mom had strict rules um, or my mom and dad had strict rules. So we definitely had like a set schedule. Um, we never fluttered fettered from that. Um, and like I said, I, we were never like shouted out, um, never yelled at. I think my, the worst thing my mom did was count backwards and we knew we were all dead. When she started to say like, 10, 9, we were like, oh my gosh, we're in so much trouble. So and I, I had to say, unfortunately, I just didn't know that there was ways of being raised differently. Yeah. So um, when I went to high school, I was like, what? Um, your mom and dad aren't together. Like your dad yells at you. So Wow. That was kind of a weird like situation for well, me. What's kind of your exposure to church or Christianity or Jesus as a kid? So um, I was raised Catholic, and my mom and dad were probably a little more charismatic Catholic. Not necessarily like you have to say these prayers, and then you'll you know you'll be saved. It was more of like you talk to Jesus. Like it was really important to know the Our Father. So we that was something you always prayed about. I mean prayed, but you could talk to Jesus. So I feel like my mom really helped me to know that I can talk to Jesus. If you can believe it or not, I was in a lot of, like, um, classes for Jesus. If that's, like, so I had to do, like, journaling to Jesus. I had to do, like, reading Bible Jesus. And then you had to, there's just tons. Like, was this through the church? Yes. Was it, like, a cat, part of catechism? No. Or? It was just, like, a youth thing. And I received all these awards, met all these bishops and stuff. There's, it's wild because I just moved. So I was, like, I remember all those classes. And I bet you my family thinks I'm crazy that they don't remember any of that, but I remember it. And here was just layers and layers of books and journals. And like, I used to have to cut magazine out and like put down like, um, Jesus is my one and only. And I would have to like do a picture from a magazine. Like I'd like cut out all the, all the words and then a picture of what, what Jesus was my only crazy stuff. Like just every book, every book that I ever did, every picture of every bishop I sat with it was weird. Yeah. It's crazy. So it's wild. And so I think I always had a relationship with Jesus from the get go. Yeah. Like always just, that's for sure. I'm yeah. very lucky. And it seems like uh, the discipline of doing it too, even if yeah. it's a formal class that maybe at the time you didn't care for or whatever, it, it's like a, uh, it's an investment. It's goes on your calendar and you set it aside. Yeah, and I, I have to t- say I don't think I disliked it, not any of it, because whoever my leaders were, were fun. Yeah. So I loved it. You know, they were really creative, because all those books were, like, in my little hope chest, and I was like, wow, I did a lot of journaling to Jesus, lots, you know? Wow. like So So that was really cool to see that, because I was like, I know I took those classes, and I think I'm crazy, but then I see it, and I'm like, oh, I did, you know? So yeah. anyways, yeah. So you're, you're kind of talking about... Um at least how, how I'm interpreting it, kind of like an insulated, protected home. Mm-hmm. Um, there's 10 of you living in a two-bedroom house, so maybe that's not overly uh, cozy. <laughs> but it seems like, at least like emotionally, there's like a security in, you're saying you went to high school and you couldn't believe that people's parents were like divorced. or Yeah, didn't get along or yelled. What, what was kind of like that process? You know, so many times um, that middle school, high school time is such a transition from kind of the innocence, the naivete of childhood. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, you're kind of thrust out into the world. You get exposed to, to things. What was that like for you? So I think a lot of times people go to elementary school and they take their friends to high school with them, you mm-hmm. know, so they're together. That wasn't the case for me. Um, I went to an all-girl Catholic school, so I was removed from, like, being the coolest girl. This is they're elementary in, or yeah, high school? Elementary. Okay. So all that, you're with your friends, and then you move into high school, and you don't take your friends with you. So you kind of start new. So that was definitely hard. But my mom and dad never gave us, like, the opportunity to gripe or to even it, – it sounds awful, but it worked for me. Um, but there was, like, no, like, you know, suck it up mentality, and it worked for me. It just wasn't abuse to me. Mm. Um, that just really worked for me. So you weren't allowed to use any energy to complain? or. Oh, or... if we complained, we were in big time trouble. We never complained. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, you couldn't say you didn't like my mom's food. You had to eat her food and say thank you when you're done. One time I got sp- spinach. This is one great thing about my mom and dad. If they saw we didn't enjoy food, they never bought it again. Because it's too expensive to feed eight kids that aren't going to eat it. So they would try something 
probably watch all of us eating it or not eating it. If we chose not to, they just didn't cook it again. So one night we had spinach, cooked spinach, disgusting. And we tended to, all of us tended to like, when we didn't like something, we scattered it out. So, so it, it looks like, like, yes. like you, got, you ate most of it. But I couldn't, but the spinach doesn't really scatter out like peas and corn. Um, so I put it in my milk. Like I put it in my milk. Were you found out? Oh, I got in so much trouble. Man, I was in so much trouble. I had to, I had to drink it. You had to drink your spinach milk? Because <laughs> my dad said I was being sneaky. And that's not a good trait. So I had to drink it. Wow. I'm sure you have so many stories of just that many siblings. Oh, yeah. They can, that could be its own podcast. <laughs> we don't have to talk about bakery. We could do all family podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. So uh, high school. Tell me, tell me about high school. I think there's a lot of students I've found out listen to this podcast. But what, what was kind of your, your heart's desire in high school? What were you like? What were you into? I think to be accepted for sure. Okay. You know, that's like when you go into a school and you're like, you leave from popular to nobody, mm. um, you know, it's, I think I just wanted to be accepted by people. And so, I mean, I might have tried too hard. I don't know. I don't, I really don't know about high school. I don't remember it being difficult. I just remember me trying to just be accepted, you know? So um, I can't really, I don't really remember. Um, like it wasn't bad. I loved my high school. My daughter went there because I loved it so much. Which high school was it? St. Joseph's. Okay. I loved it too because there's no boys there. So you are literally just, you're focused on your curriculum. Uh-huh. And secondly, like your goal, like I was like not very smart. I hated school. I'm going to be honest. Could not stand school at all. But people were competing against their A's. It wasn't like, you know, you were like your friends getting an A and you're like, I got to get an A too. You know, like it wasn't like. That's all you really had to do. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You're focused on your education. I just didn't. I just couldn't do that. That just wasn't my, my thing. But it did make me want to be a better learner, mm-hmm. for sure. I just, that was really hard for me. So, I don't know. I think that's probably it. I do know, like, I was just realizing this recently. I chopped my hair off because you realize that your body is not, it's not little anymore. And you're like, okay, I think boys are looking at me, so I want to chop my hair off and look like a boy, so I'm not looked at. So I want to say, I, I definitely try to like have like more of a boy look to me. Yeah. And I remember like hanging out with my brothers and they would be like, their friends would be like, I like your brother, he's a really cool dude. <laughs> my brother would be like, that's a girl. That's my sister. <laughs> 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 he would get like so mad. I'm like, it doesn't bother me, so <laughs> who cares? You know, like, <laughs> now, I, I know enough about you that um, even by this time, baking is part of your life. Um, tell, just kind of paint a picture of where baking comes into your life. Cause we're going to talk about it when we get there. But, um, for those who don't know, you own a bakery. Um, but it wasn't like one day you woke up as an adult and thought, I want to open a bakery. It's something that had been a, a seed planted in you since you were a little girl. So just explain that to people. Okay. So I'm very lucky because my mom and dad would tell us that we did things that were great. Probably to help them out. So they probably like said, you're the best baker or the best cooker, you know? So she didn't have to bake. 100%. I'm convinced. <laughs> like she always did like, you're the best looker. So all of us would be like, we're the best looker, you know, like to find like things that she can find. So they were very smart, like best cleaner. So smart. Anyway, so um, I want to say at seven years old, I definitely had my own KitchenAid. My mom got a Hobart, Hobart, which that was a name before KitchenAid. And um, she said it was mine. So I got that when she died. It was like the best gift ever because I was seven. I'll never forget it. And so I had my own little KitchenAid, which was really my mom's, but I say it was mine because um, I was always using it. But she gave me a cookbook. I was in a lot of classes for baking because I really liked it. She said I did it really good. So I was like, I want to be better at it. So um, she put me in a lot of classes, a lot of cake decorating classes and all that stuff. So I have always baked since I was seven. And I still have the mixers from that when I was seven. So that's like 50 years ago. That machine is 50 years old. Pretty rad. But um, so I've always loved it. I honestly do not remember ever saying I want to own a bakery. But when I opened my bakery, people from high school reached out to me and said, you always said that you wanted to open a bakery. And I was like, I did. Like, I don't remember that. I just, so I must have always wanted to do that. Um... So I just always knew I wanted to bake. But I also like to sew. So when we were younger, my mom and dad would like stick us in front of a television and give us a sock and a baseball. And we would have to sew our socks. So we ripped our socks. We didn't get 
new socks. <laughs> like that wasn't happening. Um, we had to repair those socks. So I think my mom and dad taught us trades, mm. trades, and I think that's what I really wanted to do here at, at Bridge, mm. was teach trades because I feel like those are probably a lost art. So I was really appreciative of, uh, of that because I knew how to sew and I knew how to yeah. how to cook so um, and bake. So um, I think that was my mom and dad's really good thing for us is to tell us that we did yeah. something excellent so we can take that position in the line of 10 people. Yeah. So that's where that started. So like I said, um, people in high school had reached out to me and told me that I had always said I wanted to open a bakery. I'm like, that's wild, you know, so... That's awesome. Yeah. I, um, just just a funny side story that people might not know, but um, I I learned that you sewed many years ago. Because, um, <laughs> I have a pair of um, golden jeans. I just can't find. Them. I, I feel like they're beyond repair now. But um, uh, are they? I think we can a, always patch about, up. Something. Until about a year and a half ago, there was a good chance I was wearing a pair of jeans that. Krista sewed back together, especially in the seat of the pants, I think is the appropriate way to say that. I'm going to tell you, I used a lot of thread. Yeah. <laughs> I was like going back and forth. Uh, yeah, I think they were like the, um, what is it? They're like like partially stretchy in the fabric. Yes. So I, I, I feel like if they weren't stretchy, they would have held better, but the stretch kind of just. Yes, broke. it yeah. broke. Yeah, we yeah. fixed it. It's fine. We'll keep fixing them. They should probably go like in, like in a, you know, hall of shame jeans kind of thing Maybe one of those shadow boxes with a little plaque 100 i have one for you it's in the office <laughs> we're trying to get rid of okay anyways so you uh you you go to all girls high school i'm i'm curious just kind of a sidebar question um because i had forgotten you went to an all girls high school and i'm just thinking through high school and um if i'm honest at that time in my life i don't know how i would have gone to high school had there not been girls there <laughs> like that sounds like i think just in the teenage boy like just the drama of girls and the meeting girls and the learning to talk to. I feel like there was a lot of like, in some ways that made high school like exciting every day. Probably. What was it, what was it like to go to all girls school and what was kind of like your thoughts on, on boys? Cause you were saying they were, you thought maybe they were starting to look at you, but you yeah. were at all girls high school. So, well, eighth grade hits. Okay. That's what it, what, you know, and you're, all the boys are like doing stupid stuff to you. So you're like, oh, I don't like this attention. So I'm just going to chop my hair off, you know? Mm kind of thing so um but there's still boys there at the high school so we have a so you have a brotherly school and a sister school that's what they're called and the brother school is just down the way that's St. John Bosco so I have five brothers that attend there as well but at the time it was just two of my brothers mm, three anyways um which is great because you're protected so you have a protection there um, at that school, so nobody really can hurt you or do anything stupid because your brothers will probably kill them. So, but it was awesome because you get to see them. They come on Fridays. You do all the dances with them. You do all the football games with them, and they're all graded. So you go to those because you're going to get a point or extra credit. So you, they really do kind of try to emerge the the two schools together off campus. It's it, so. like literally like you got it like almost a grade. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because they really wanted you to like make sure that that's your brotherly school. So you're a connected school, but separate. So we did a whole lot of like really bad things, like naughty things, like, you know, destroying their, they would destroy our campus. We would destroy their campus. You know, it was always like a battle with the boys. <laughs> so, but it was fun. I, I loved my high school. I really did. I think I loved it because you didn't have to worry about getting up and being appropriately like look pretty and all that stuff you can just get up and you have a uniform mm. you have high standards for the uniform which side note i just have to say this i um had a nun that would her name was sister janet and every time she would walk by she'd be like your skirt's too short your skirt's too short you know all the time and i'd be like she's always after me right so one time she stopped me she's like young lady your shirt's too skirt short and i'm like okay but sister janet your skirt's so long and she was like you in the office and i was like i'm like, I just got in so much trouble for telling her that her skirt's too long. So long story short, I just got an order for her 80th birthday. I'm doing her 80th birthday cake on this Did Friday. She know? Did she know? <laughs> she said that um, I told the one of the nuns came in to pay, and she said, I said, I'm dying that Sister Janet is going gonna, gonna to be 80. I always thought like she was already 80. <laughs> Anyways, I said, I can't believe I'm doing her cake. I said, I got in so much trouble from her all the time. And she said, oh, Kristen, she saves every article that's written up on you. I'm like, oh. No way. How sweet. Like, I thought she hated me. Oh. So, so I thought that was sweet. But yeah, she gave me detention for 
That's big time office (laughs) ammo that you used to get yelled at by a nun. Yes. Uh, I'm going to keep that in my back pocket for when it's convenient. Mr. Janet. (laughs) Mr. Janet. I'm blessed. Uh, So so post high school, um, out into the world, what, what was next for you? So my mom was a great mom, and she really wanted me to go to college, but I hated school. And so they were like, Krista, can you just go to dental um, school? So I chose dental technician to be a dental technician. I personally did not want to do that. I did it for my mom and dad. Um, She kept on saying, Krista, you got to find something that you want to do because you need to have something under your belt for your life. And I was like, Mom, I just want to be a mom. I literally just want to be a mom. I just want to be you. And she was like, okay, that's all fine and dandy, but that's not going to pay the bills if you don't find, you know, if you don't get married, you know. So Mm. they sent me to dental school. Um, I did a year at um, Cerritos and a year at USC. So it's like a, I don't, it's like a combo school that they do. So it was a lot of fun, but not, I still like, I I didn't, wasn't into it. I just didn't want to do that. Um, So I end up working at a restaurant instead right when school ended I was working at a restaurant anyways but the rules at my mom and dad's house were and my dad had lots of strict rules um so you either do part-time and part-time school um um, work or you do work full-time if you work full-time you have to pay rent at the house so my mom and dad were really encouragers of being adults Mm. and that you have a responsibility and you need to pay um otherwise you go to school and we'll help you out so I did not do that. Um, I ended up, like, after school, I finished that, and then I was still taking, like, another class. I want to say, like, an art or something, and I really wasn't taking those classes. I was ditching it, and I was just working at um, a restaurant. And so my dad said, you know, I have strong rules. And he said, um, you need to make sure, you're, you know, you're, um, you know, sign up for a semester in, at Sridhar's College. Well, I didn't, so he kicked me out. So this is a true story. I got kicked out. I had nowhere to go. And I remember I had a little Volkswagen, and I was riding maybe like 103 with all my stuff in the back because my dad put everything out front. Like there was no joke in a boat, and my dad kicked me out. And he did that to a lot of us just because he was like, hey, we have rules here. If you don't obey them, you're out. So I'm like, I don't know, 18 because uh, I graduated when I was 17, and I was already taking a class, Cerritos College, at my last year, because you can graduate early at, Cerrit- at um, St. Joseph's. So they put me in school at, at Cerritos. So I was already taking that class. So I was probably like 18 or 19, they kicked me out. And um, I remember like driving like 103 down the freeway, and a police officer um, pulled me over. <laughs> I was in this little my little yellow Volkswagen, and he pulled over, and he was like really loud, like, pull over, pull over. So he pulled over, and I couldn't run down the window because I was crying because I just got kicked out. And he was like, open the door, open the door. And I was like, I'm in so much trouble. So I opened up the door. He sits down in the car, and he's all, what is going on, young lady? You were driving 103 in a Volkswagen. I'm all, I just got kicked out from my dad. And he was like, looked in the back of the car and he was like oh yes is that all your stuff and I'm all yes and he's all do you know where you're going I go I don't know where I'm going (laughs) so he told me um drive safe and call a friend when you get off the freeway and find somewhere to stay tonight because and he didn't give me a ticket it was really sweet because he felt actually really bad for me because I was just this young girl driving 103 nowhere to the beach because I lived at the beach I loved the beach so it was just funny because you know that was my life right there and I just remember calling a friend and I stayed there um, for like two months and then I found somewhere to live and I lived out of the house for like maybe a year and then my mom and dad saw that it probably just wasn't a good situation where I was living, and they um, told me to come back, and then my sister Tressa and Chester invited me to live there with them, so I lived with Chester and Tressa who live, I mean, they also attend this church, so that's like a long and short story of how I got to church here. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, just maybe backing up a little bit, because you um, had already mentioned you were kind of raised Catholic, um, but with kind of a push towards knowing who Jesus was. Uh, Where were you in your faith at this time in your life? Okay, so I'll, um, so I want to say I've always had, it's just automatic for us to know that we have to go to church and stuff like that. That's just ingrained in you when you're Catholic. It's every Sunday, automatic. Mm-hmm. So I want to say like in high school, I probably wasn't um, that 
wasn't like walking. I knew who Jesus was, still praying, all that good stuff, but not like a relationship at all, not even remotely. I'm going to say after high school, definitely not, because there's a whole nother story to that, and I'm not going to get into that. Um, but I want to say that that just wasn't where I was at, for sure, but always knew there was Jesus in my life, for sure. Um, so that he was just put on the back burner. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to say I didn't like pray. I always prayed, but there wasn't like this like strong push to go to church, strong push to read the Bible, strong push to actually go to, you know, do anything church wise. Um, so that was definitely far from it. But my sister Tressa invited me in seventh grade to a junior um, high um Bible study at Trinity, and I loved it. And I loved it because of the leaders. So I really think, like, I look at Joel and Abby, and they remind me of them, and I was in love with them. And because they loved Jesus, I loved Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I had an experience of Christianity that was a little bit different from Catholicism, where Catholicism is a little more, like, rigorous, like, you do these things to get to to Jesus, right? You have to, you know, you have to say the Hail Mary ten times to get your sins forgiven. You know, I'm like, silly not silly, but you know what I'm saying? Like stuff that's yeah, more like, perform. Yes. Performance. Yeah. yeah. And this was not, this was like, Jesus loves you wherever you're at, whatever you're doing. And I learned that from these two. So that definitely helped me through high school for sure. I also knew Tressa was trusted because that's what she brought me there. So I knew that her faith was very similar to that same faith that those two youth workers showed mm. me. So I loved that little church. It was the smallest church. I want to say it maybe had only 100 spots. It had little two rows of pews. It was very, very like little, I want to say kind of similar to Mariners, that little chapel mm. on a you know much smaller scale. Yeah. So, and I loved that church. So I definitely carried on what I learned from those two youth workers into high school, mm. for sure. So, and then you have to take a religion class in um, at St. Joseph's. And my religion teachers were 100% charismatic, very different. So we would every morning have to meditate. So that meditation was to Jesus and only Jesus. And that was just your half an hour of just talking to him, going through what happened the night before or the week, whatever. So I loved that. We would get done and when we would journal and then we'd go into scripture. Mm. The books were only this gospel in high school. So every year was a book. So I loved that. That was a lot of fun for me because they were really cool. They were nuns that didn't have habits. Uh, they wore regular clothes. They were just really uh, probably like, oh, I don't know, it was a wild, just wild, like how cool it was. So you still always had a relationship with Jesus on a totally different level. Mm -hmm. And I think what people would think Catholicism was about. Yeah. That was really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So you get kicked out. Uh, mm -hmm. You go 103. You live right into the stereotype of crying girl doesn't get a ticket. Which, that is not me. Like, I am like, when a cop pulls me over, I'm like, I did it. Yeah. I'm guilty. You know, which, I never get a ticket because of that. Because I'm always like, totally my fault. I'm a loser. You know, like, that's, I was illegally doing something. And they always, for some unknown reason, let me get away with it. I don't, I'm not, I mean, I've only been pulled over two or three times in my life. So, it's not like I'm some crazy driver. I am a crazy driver. But I get away with it a lot. I can't remember what comedian, but said if you have kids, you need to reach back and pinch them and then roll down the window so the, the cop knows you have a crying child in the car. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> that is brilliant. This, we are not advocating pinching or harming no, a child No, but I've way. never been pulled over with a child in my car, so <laughs> they were all younger, and I try not to drive unsafe when any human's in my car, but me personally, I have a place to go, so I'm always like, mm -hmm, you know, driving pretty fast, so anyways. So it sounds like kind of treading water around 20 years old, and then you, you land with Chester and Teresa. And yes. And um, just keep kind of pushing the, for, the story forward from okay. there. So you said that's um, how you landed at this church. Yes. So I was at my sister's house, um, probably in between like 20 to 22, I want to say, maybe uh, somewhere around that age. Um, and they might have been, I might be wrong on some of the dates, because I think I was 23. When I was brought here, I think, yeah, I think it was 23, 22 or 23 when I was here. Um, yeah, so that, that'd be about 20, almost on the cusp of being 21, which I was being very naughty. Mm. I was not a naughty girl. I did not, was not, um, never like drinking issues, not party girl. But at 21, for some unknown reason, 
Um, I just was a little naughty for that year. Um, anyways, but I was living at Tress and Chester's, and every Sunday they would ask me to go to church, and every Sunday I would tell them no. Mm. Um, and But she would ask every Sunday faithfully, you want to go to church? No. Every Sunday. So after 21, I want to say about 22, I was like, I, she invited me to church. I went to church here once. I liked it. But, when, you know, I said yes one time. Um, and then um, I want to say, like, that was just like a random day. I wasn't, I think I came actually on my own. I don't know if, I don't think I even came with her that Sunday. Then one Sunday, I was 22. I was um, right before Easter. Uh, she said, um, Chris, do you want to go to church again? And I'm like, I do. I want to go with you guys. And I remember they always left. They knew I was going to say no. So they weren't prepared for me to say no. And I really, I remember this so strongly um, in their condominium. Chester had to sit down on one of his chairs and wait. And I don't think they wanted to wait because they were probably running late. But I said yes. And they were like so excited. But in the inside of Chester, I might have been like, she needs to hurry up. Like, you know, like hopefully she hurries up because we're going to church. You know, I think he had to do something that morning. It was just really funny. But I did take them off a little bit by not tick them off. I, I t- took them off of their normal regimen. They never got mad. They were so sweet. But I went to church. And I remember asking Jesus into my life that day. I was like, oh, this is, this is a game changer for me. Mm. So that was like in April for sure. And then um, that, that was it. I was like sold out for Jesus. I definitely loved that. And it was amazing. So that's how I, I got here. Mm-hmm. And um, that's pretty much how that went. And then Millie, um, I joined, I got pregnant. I had a little girl named Sarah Bridget. Um, and we started attending um, all the mums groups here. And it was just such a great uh, community because you feel like you really do as a mom feel like you're the only person that's going through this. Yeah. And it's such a reprieve to like go somewhere and be like, oh, yeah, I thought my kid only did that. You know, you're like, this is amazing. Like, I got other women that are losing sleep that are chasing around a child that you adore, but are acting like brats. And you're like, I want to murder them, but you really don't. But you just want to like ruin their necks. This podcast does not condone murdering children. <laughs> never, <laughs> never. Uh, no, never. But like, because I absolutely love children and I love, I, like I lived to be a mom. So mm. it was like the greatest day in the world. You know, to be a mom, you're like, this is, yeah, it's like everything you ever wish for. And I just remember like, when I first had Sarah Bridget calling my mom and like being like, which some of you guys might have heard this story before, so I apologize. But I remember like calling my mom like the first two weeks of being alone because she took care of me the first two weeks because she wanted to make sure like, hey, you need to be, you need to eat. It's gonna be hard to eat. It's gonna like she just took care of me like the first two yeah. weeks, which I just so appreciate it that I did it for my daughter as well because that was like, I have lunch. You made me breakfast. Like I'm just, I'm just don't even know what to do with this child. So. It was such a blessing, but I remember like being alone like two months in and like calling my mom like, Mom, what and why did you do eight of this? Like eight, eight times. Like (laughs) this one sucking the life out of me and I don't think I ever want to do more than one. So I remember like thinking this is exhausting and this is wonderful, but I'm not going to do any more. But just talking about the amnesia of it all. Like you're like, I can't believe people do more than one of these things. (laughs) And like, I don't know, like eight or nine months. It's like, you know, I, I kind of miss that little baby. We should have another one. Well, like, oh, say we lo- totally forgot about all the, the newborn stuff. Seriously. It's like, like, like when they can say your name. Yeah. Mom or dad. You're like, like, or I love you. And you're like, what did you say? What did you say? Like, what did you say? And it might have been like, I love you or whatever. And you're like, I swear I think they said I love me. So it's like, yeah, you want to have more after that for sure. But I still didn't want more. I mean, that was definitely not, like, Max was like, what? What do you mean? I'm like, I'm right. Can I have another baby? So, yeah, I definitely just wanted one. But, I mean, three is amazing. So, I mean, you, I can't imagine life without Max or Mick. Like, that's wild, you know. So, yeah, best yeah. day ever to have a baby. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. Anyways. There's a lot, of, a lot of young moms, either young moms now or soon to be in the coming months that relate will relate with what you just said. Yeah. It's wild because you're so, I, I know this sounds awful, but I call it a beautiful tragedy because you're like, you can barely sleep. You can't even eat. You're not very sure if you've showered in the last week and you have this child that's crying and you're like, why is this happening to me? And then they smile and you're like, oh my 
I just was everything. This was worth all of it, you know. So, you know, it's just, it's the yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so you're kind of in your your mid twenties. You're here. Um, I think I I just want to connect some dots to the point where. I guess we haven't even said this, but Krista is the director of children's ministry here at the church. Um, so how do you get from that place? It sounds like maybe um, on Easter when you're 21, 22, you accept Jesus. You're trying to figure a life out, um, trying to find some stability. How do you get from that point to maybe into your, your 30s and beyond? Okay, so um, once I... Once I have a baby and I'm attending here, you you realize okay. Well, one thing for sure is, um, children bring you to your knees. You need you're in constant prayer. You know it, they really do. Like I think they're amazing. Like I'm not trying to not advocate against children, but they you know you're exhausted and so you only have Jesus to to like hold on to really honestly. And I was kind of like a single mom because although I was married, uh, my husband was not really in the picture. So. You really do lean on, I, I remember like grasping like, okay, you know, I have Jesus. He's my heavenly father. He's going to take care of me. So you definitely like have this really strong core relationship mm-hmm. with God because he's primarily getting you through every night, yeah. you know, through throw ups, through sick, you know, like it's, you have this great week and the next month they're throwing up, you know, <laughs> you're yeah. like, then it's, you know, it just, it just, it's constant, right? Um, but like I said, I would do it again. I would do it tomorrow. If you brought me back to 22, I'd be like, let's do eight. I, I wanted to have 12 kids because my mom and dad did it so well. And you have one, you're like, yeah, no, never mind. 12 is out of the, <laughs> 12 is out of the, out of the, out of the, the situation completely. But you come to this church and you have a core, you start building relationships with other moms. You have Millie, who's like a phenomenal uh, mentor. You have Ruth Ann, phenomenal mentor. Phyllis, phenomenal. And then you have Andrea Redeker. So you have these women that are like surrounding you. And then you have other moms. And then we're, we're building relationships also as well with these moms after. So now you're going to lunch at Burger King and letting them jump in that disgusting pit of balls that are probably full of bacteria and if you anybody knew me back then they called me the, the antibacteria queen because i would have like three things in my pocket i'd be like like squirting like, i was like literally neurotic on the cheeks all the time i no lie i think i your licked it. hair it's uh <laughs> i literally would be like this like under my nose in my mouth i was like i'm we're not getting sick we were always sick anyways it didn't stop <laughs> me from being sick but anyways you you build a relationship here and you realize like this is a great family and so your family's here. You have another, you have a family that is not just, it's a church family, but it is your family. So you become just closer. You have, you want to volunteer here. You just want to do more stuff at church because it's just such a safe environment and you know your children are safe. So I knew Bridget was safe. Uh, Jan ran the nursery. She was amazing. Um, my kids were under Jan, under Nancy, Millie, all of these ladies. They all watched my daughter. It was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so there were just these great moms mm. that would come in and watch your kid, and they were moms. It was just, like, they just, I don't know, like, you knew they were, like, loving your child. They were, like, these jolly moms. I don't know. You know, like, they were looking forward to holding your child. It's just amazing. So you just really wanted to bring your child here. And um, so you just spent a lot of your time here, and then... Bridget was almost two. I will never forget this phone call. I was in this little apartment. This is wild. My daughter lives in Long Beach on a street called Bennett, and I lived on the street right next to her with Bridget. Pretty wild. Like, so cool. When I drive by, I'm like, Bridget, do you remember that? It was like the kitchen we were in. Like, Millie called me at that kitchen. Like, I drive by it every day to get to my daughter's house. Wow. Um, so it's really cool. But I remember, like, sitting at this little table, and I was making bread that day. I made bread a lot because we weren't, we didn't have a lot of money. So I remember making bread that day and um, we, were, we were waiting for it to rise. And Millie called and we were sitting at this little sewing machine table that was mine when I was a little girl. Um, and we were just a little tiny, like you couldn't sit. She was on this side and I was on that side. My plate fit there and her plate fit there. And Millie called and she said, hey, Krista, we have an opening here. It's on Wednesday nights. Would you be interested in taking it? And I'm like... Uh, I don't even, probably not. You know, I'm not, I don't know how to teach people. What year is this, Krista? Uh, so it's 1998. Okay. 90, 
Seven ninety-eight, maybe. Okay. No, 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 ninety. I'm sorry, not ninety-eight, because Bridget's ninety-three. She was almost two, so ninety-four, 90, ninety-five. Yeah, ninety-five. I'm thinking of Max. Ninety-five. Yeah, wow. it was definitely ninety-five because she was turning two in May. Mm. I mean, yeah. So she was definitely it was that April. So anyway, so Millie asked, and I said, "Oh yeah, I don't know how to teach people." And she's like, "Just come in. Let's just talk about it. Like, don't say no. Let me show you what it's about." So I said, okay, I'll check it out, knowing that I was going to say no. Now, mind you, I already worked with Millie and Chet. I had been working with them cleaning homes. Okay. So they had a side job cleaning homes. And so I was always working with them. I worked with them on um, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays. And it might have been Millie, might have been Tressa, might have been Chester, I mean Chet. So I always worked um, cleaning homes. I always had like a little side um, gig and that was just like fun money for me to like be able to go like down the street get a cookie for Bridget or whatever because um, we live down in Long Beach and you don't drive anywhere you walk everywhere so anyways so she asked for that and um, so I came in and met with her and I was definitely like no I can't do this I'm not worthy I'm not holy enough definitely had that like mentality mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. need to have a theology uh, you know definitely just not worthy you need to know all the Bibles by heart kind of mentality. Yeah. And um, so I didn't think I was worthy of it. And then Millie kind of explained it to me. And I was like, she's, I, I thought, thought that, let me just give it a try. I'll give it a try for a year. And it was called um, um, Pioneer Cl- Clubs. Pioneer Clubs. And it was a really cool thing that was happening here. So basically, it's like basically a boy, school, boy scout or a girl scout kind of idea. But all Christian. So they teach you like how to light a fire, how to camp, how to, it was so much fun, like all kinds of like basics. And, um, we had a lot of classes and a lot of kids. So I ran, I want to say it was like the nursery was open for sure, but I didn't run that. I only ran K through sixth grade. And so you had teachers. So those teachers in kindergarten and first, and it was second and third, fourth and fifth, and then six was by themselves because um, it was a whole nother class by themselves completely. So I had that many teachers, and they were all young couples, and they were much older than me. So I definitely felt like I was not worthy of being mm-hmm. under them, I mean, or above them. So I never had like any type of like, I never felt like I had an authority over anybody. I always felt like we were very equal. Um, and um, I just basically gathered lessons for them and prepared them and handed it to them and made sure they had everything that ever that they needed for those classes. And I really just got to know families. It was just so much fun because I was at like a lower level of children raising, right? I wasn't at a level of like where you have kids that are in school. Because you probably know your friendships are going to change. Right. Your friendships will change from when they're children and infants, um, toddlers, and then they get into school. And your friendships change because you want to be friends with those kids they're in school with. Because right. you need to know what their life, not in a bad, creepy way, but it is in a creepy way. You want to know what their lives are like, those families, yeah. and who your child's hanging out with. So your friendships change for sure. So I want to say like that's when you break off with your element, I mean with your toddler infant friends and you move into you know elementary friends. So it was nice to be around people that had kids that were older cuz most of them were parents to those kids that were in fifth and fourth and second and third like they were volunteering their time and it was just really cool. It was just a really cool environment just learning from them and watching parenting. That was amazing cuz I was just like learning like how kids, parents were, were like, parents of boys. That was wild for me because I had a little girl. So I was like, they're amazing. Like, this is so cool. So I don't know. I just, I feel like it was not, it was just such a learning experience here. And yeah. I just, had, I don't know. I just really had a really great, I've had a great life here at Bridge. <laughs> I really have. So I did that for some, for some years. I did that every Wednesday. That was my job. So here, at, and I was also still, you know, working with Millie and Chet doing houses. So Mm. yeah, it was a lot of fun. I loved it. I love how God connects those dots. Like you think um, I'm going to say yes to a job that's one day a week and little do you know, you're also getting a front row seat on parenting children. One And not to mention, you have to like read the lessons, right? So you're reading a lesson that they're going to be teaching and whoever that that curriculum is, is taking a different look than you would ever take. So every curriculum, they have their own opinion about what that story is or how to teach it. You're learning on top of that. So you're like getting, you're getting like a Bible lesson 
too. Even though it's not for you, you're like, mm-hmm. this is amazing how they taught this this lesson. So I feel like I've always had just like such an emergent of immersion of teaching kids. Yeah. Because I was always having to do a lesson for, you know, all those grade levels at a different. So it was just, it was amazing. It was just amazing. Especially because I feel like when you're a parent, you are a teacher. Oh, a hundred percent. From the beginning. Like yeah. you don't mean to be, you don't, you didn't know that, but you're like, oh yeah, don't put your finger in that light socket. And yeah, don't eat that chili pepper. You're going to die. You know, like <laughs> you're like constantly teaching them, you know? And so you realize that as a parent, you're just a teacher. So now you're learning to teach about the Bible. It just amazing. It's just amazing. It's just stinging amazing. Amazing. So, you know, I don't know. It's, it's so cool to just hear the history of a church because you're talking about the mid nineties. Mm-hmm. You're talking about, man, I found, um, support and friendship and parenting and I'm, um, you know, I'm 35. I have two young ones. I feel like that's still the story. Right. We're like, oh, how did, how did you hear about us? Oh, we were just looking for a place that our children would be known and that mm-hmm. we could, you know, build relationships with like-minded parents. It's like, yeah. it's like the culture that you came from, into and yeah. you've continued. Yeah. But um, I, I mean, we don't have to belabor the point, but one thing you said that I thought was interesting, and I, I think it might um, resonate with a lot more people than you might think, but you made the comment that, um, you know, you felt all, oftentimes like a single mom. Mm-hmm. And you found a lot of support in in the church. I, mm-hmm. I'm just curious, what with some years of perspective and that that feeling with young kids, maybe it's speaking to a mom who's maybe married and husband travels for work and mm-hmm. is just gone all the time, or maybe it's just like this. This is a really tough situation I'm in. What what would you say to them? Well, okay. I, I mean, I don't know. If this is something that they'd want to hear, but I am just invested in my child. I really became like. Um, I really wanted her to feel secure. I never wanted her to feel like um, she was missing out on anything. I never ever talked negatively about Amaro, although he was not around. And not because of work. He was not around because of work. He is an alcoholic. So um, I think I just really wanted to invest in her so that she knew that this was not a, like, it wasn't a negative thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, I never wanted her to know, like, her dad's not here because something else. So I don't even know if she even knew that. Well, not probably until she was an older adult, but I really, I felt like it was really important just to invest that time that you have with that child. You can't take back. Right. Yeah. So every day I wanted to make sure I didn't do something that I regretted. So I just, it sounds crazy, but I'm just really focused on raising my child. Yeah. Um, and so even like when I would work, um, I was fortunate that I had a mom and dad that took care of them, um, took care of my daughter. I never pawned my daughter off on anybody. Um, so the rules were that if I went to um, visit my mom, it wasn't for me to go to the store. You took your daughter everywhere with you. My mom and dad said, you don't have children for other people to raise. So I think that mm-hmm. stayed inside me forever. And so even the time that they watched my daughter, I never took advantage of that. It, I never said, hey, mom, can I go to the grocery store? I knew that I was going to rush back, spend some quality time with my mom as well, because I really wanted my daughter to know the life of my mom and dad because they were phenomenal. And you really want them to see, like, you want your kids to see healthy marriages. Mm-hmm. That's probably, you know, like, you'll see that with adults, as you, with Colton. You're going to want them around healthy marriages. You probably love being around Natalie's parents. That's, you know what I'm saying? Like, they, you see that there's, like, good communication there. It's just all really good examples. So I, w- I want to say, really, for me, as a single mom, I really wanted to, like, not regret any moment with her, and I didn't want to waste any moment with her. Mm-hmm. So we just did, it's really funny, because my daughter's, um, just had a baby and she doesn't want to be in the house and she said mom I just remember you always leaving so we were always like walking jogging not jogging but like doing something some type of excursion of learning so I was never like you know it was either reading outside you know smelling the flowers like there was every little moment that I could for her to enjoy what Jesus gave us so it was like look at the clouds Jesus made them like there was perpetual like talking about Jesus in her life because I didn't want her to not ever take advantage of what she had in front of her that Jesus made so I appreciate that my daughter remembered them Mm, yeah (laughs) tissues I'm not going to cry. <laughs> You're crying. No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, so I think for that and maybe not to feel guilty, 
Mm. I think moms in general, we just feel guilty. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah, it it's, really sucks. it's such a weird, um, I mean, it's something I've worked through is like, you feel so secure in yourself and then you have kids and your kid maybe misbehaves or something. And for whatever reason, so deep inside you, your first reaction is, and it sounds terrible, is, oh my gosh, this makes me look bad. <laughs> 100%. It's like, man, if you don't get a hold of that, all of a sudden your kid's performance reflecting you is such mm. a such a terrible That's, place it's to be. Poopy, yeah, yeah, it's not not worth it. Yeah. I, I love that. I, I think the thing that sticks with me that will stick with me of what you just said is, you know, this situation was not ideal. I, I love that you said you never allowed yourself to speak poorly. Mm-mm. I think that is such a reflection of how you were raised by your parents. Um, I remember one of the things you had said earlier was um, that complaining was just not allowed. It was yeah. it was like a punishable offense. It was. Um, so like I'd imagine that if you grow up in that, um, feeling sorry for yourself is something that doesn't last long. No. Yeah, um, yeah I, I love that because I think sometimes the resentment can kind of like overflow and before you know it, you're wondering why your kids are misbehaving or why they act mm-hmm. one way, it, you know, and so uh, so often, like you're saying, it's, it's your kids need to see a healthy relationship one way or the other. Yeah. And you really do want to put them around people that have, sorry, excuse me, my drop. I had one drop <laughs> coming oh. out. <laughs> Anyways, you really do want them to be around um, healthy relationships. And the church, if it's, you know, like not all churches are healthy. I mean, you still have good and bad in all of them. But um, that doesn't, that should never fetter your love to Jesus. Like, mm. you know, humans will, all, and I remember telling my daughter that, and my kids, people will always let you down, but God will not. Yeah. You cannot focus on that person. Um, because if you are looking to somebody for Jesus, you're, you, it's just, it's never going to pan out. You, we're, we're sinners. We're going to let you down. I, I told my kids all the time, I'm going to let you down a lot, and I'm sorry, but Jesus isn't. So, don't look to me to be Jesus. I'm going to try my best. Yeah. But I'm going to let you down a whole lot, a whole lot. I'm going to say sorry a lot. Um, but um, just remember that Jesus isn't going to let you down. So just focus on him and don't blame people for your miscomings, you know, your, your shortcomings. Just it's not that's not fair, you know, people. So, you know, I don't know. Anyways, but either way. Back to you single moms, um, don't feel guilty. You know, that's just a lie. We, we are never going to be good enough, I guess, in our minds. But I think that if you're with a support group, you'll find out that nobody's good enough. Yeah. You know, that we're all trying. We're all just, my kids tell me that I'm a duck all the time, that I'm paddling for dear life underneath, but I'm like clear sailing on top. <laughs> like, <laughs> I got everybody fooled. <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, I got this, but I'm like, paddling underneath oh my gosh (laughs) so there you go that's the true story my kids i feel like there's a lot of a lot of ducks in ministry (laughs) yeah everything is fine yes coordinator control (laughs) literally we are chaos chaos coordinators anybody then your mug maybe turn it for the camera your mug is my um, camera chaos coordinator (laughs) chaos coordinator definitely i'm the ringleader of chaos anyways but yeah yeah uh, so you were working um, kind of Wednesday nights here, which um, I don't think maybe people know how deep that history is because you were working with kids and you don't have to say names, but there are adults with like growing children that used to be under your care. Yes. Which is which is so awesome. Wild. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so where does kind of the path that God takes you on lead from there? Because you didn't stay here. Um, I, I stayed here. I probably left for three years. Um, it was three years. I taught at Calvary. So my kids, um, once Bridget was old enough, she started to attend Calvary. Then I had another child, Max. Um, and I was still here and I took, um, that's, I took time off and I want to say I came back after that. And then I started to teach once Mick, uh, Max, I think he attended, got into kindergarten. And then I started teaching at Calvary. So I think I left here for like three years. Okay. Um, and I was not, no offense, but I was just miserable there. I'm not to Calvary, but you know, you, when you have a home church, you never feel like you're at home. You know, you, you hope that, but I was directly doing it because I really wanted to be on campus with my kids and I wanted to be there. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to make sure everything was going on. I liked at school. That was just my way to be you know, around my kid, Yeah. And see, like, make sure everything was good. So I did teach there for three years. I taught kindergarten. I taught high school Bible. 
taught third grade and fifth grade, and then I was a two, basically like an assistant teacher. I, I was bouncing around all those classes, but I did that for three years and never felt like at home. And finally, I just remember looking at Mario one time we were at church, and I looked at him. I'm like, I just want to go home. Mm. And you were talking about this place. Yeah, yep. it's it's a uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. Like I, I've heard people like maybe considering moving out of state. And one of the things oh, we're just looking for a, a church that feels like home. And there's a piece of me that's like, man, really pray into that and find a great church. But I think maybe people underestimate when you have years of experience and roots in the ground and relationships that you can like kind of show up and anticipate things or you know mm-hmm. someone's body language, like you're not okay, I'm going to check on you. Yeah, yeah. And you underestimate how important that is. When you go to a new place, you realize, wow, mm-hmm. those relationships ran really deep. Yeah. Um, to get that back is going to take years and years. Not, you know, this is not a, a negative. Some people yeah. are just called to go elsewhere, but um, I think a lot of people have that experience that experience and that's very true and especially when you're like a you, you know i was at a huge church um the calvary is really was really really big so you really aren't really known hmm. you'll never talk to the pastor um i was fortunate because i was already you know there at the school and i was trying to do um sunday school but they would not let me um it was very clicky and so somehow, some way, I got into VBS because they were desperate, and I was able to do that. Imagine that a church is desperate for volunteers for VBS. <laughs> so true, literally. It doesn't matter what church no. you're at. That's just how it church is. It always is, right? Yeah. And, but it was crazy because I was offering my services for Sunday school, and they didn't want them. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like, you have to be like, they didn't want me. And I was like, I've never heard of that. Like, that's how I felt so clicky. Like, they didn't know me and they were not going to let me do it at all. So that was really a bummer because I felt like they could have just pulled me on as assistant, but they wouldn't. But then here they were very desperate. VBS, somebody knows that I wanted to do it. So they call on me the night before VBS starts, give me all the curriculum. I study. I get a key to get in there and I decorate a room because... I don't know anything else but to decorate. And I guess I decorated over the top. I had no idea. I thought everybody else did that because I'm going to VBSs here. At, yeah. Yeah, yeah. At Zion Christian Center, the VBSs were off the Richter scale. And so I decorated one of the classrooms and they all came in and they were like, who is this person? Like people were coming in taking pictures. I had well, It was good. Because I immediately thought, like, you know, when you you no. raise the bar and everyone's like, oh, no, she's raising the bar for us, too. Did. The I did that. would be too high because of her. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So they hired me as a Sunday school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so then that's how I got into this. You didn't know that your decoration was your job interview. I don't know, but I taught the class, too. But they were, like, people were, like, trying to get in like the adults were. Yeah. But I only learned because Millie taught me how to do that. So, and I, you know, just from being you know, working here on Wednesday night. So I knew, and I just think they probably didn't know that. So that was awesome because then I was able to like get hired in. And so it worked out. That's how that all happened, which I was so excited, but it was really funny because they were like every year wanted me to do VBS. I didn't, wasn't going to do it because I wanted to be a teacher. But anyway, so either way, but that was funny, funny story. Like, <laughs> so what, what brought you back here? So like I said, I just remember being um, at the um, church and looking at Mario because he was attending church that one time me and I looked at him and he's all you want to go home I'm like I want to go home so we came back I um, put in my so you have to put your tent you have to put your intent in and so I just cho- chose not to put my intent to teach that year mm. and so um, went back to here and I want to say I was like three months in and Millie was like Krista we have an opening and that was for her to be her assistant okay so that's where that went so I got hired on And about what year just I couldn't even tell you I mean, I think I want to say we kind of figured it out, for, like, maybe about a year ago. Bridget and I were trying to, like, figure it out. I couldn't even tell you. I Honestly, I wish I could remember. I don't remember. Um, gosh, Max was... Mm. Okay, well, Danny just got hired. Okay, and we just... Danny's coming up on 21 years. I le- okay, let's go to this. So I left right when they were looking for a pastor. Okay. And who was the guy that came in? Oh, I don't, I can't remember. I can't remember his name either, but he was being hired. They were just listening to his sermon. Okay. And then they decided to hire him. So, uh. And that's I when you left. left. Okay. I came back right when the, um, Danny was pastored. Yeah. Wow. Wild. 
Yeah. I just m- miss that three years of not having um, been under those that those people. Kind of a little a little turmoil season, a little bit. I think might have been. I wasn't here for it, so I mean, <laughs> I didn't have to deal with it. I got Danny and Rochelle, and it was like, I'll never forget it. Like I'll never forget it. Yeah. I'm. Uh, Danielle Forsley was like the person that answered his phone. Yeah. It was amazing. She was his like front desk person, I think, or Maggie was. I don't remember, but yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I was hired in, and Rochelle and Danny were just like so cool. I remember them like just looking at me with like big gleaming smiles. I remember my first day, I had like I did like an Erica Badu look, like I had my hair totally wrapped like in like silks, you know, and and they were like, "This is gonna be great," you know. I'm like, I know, I don't know what I'm doing, but this is gonna be great, you know. Like, <laughs> So yeah, that was it. Yeah, that's where it goes. And that's, I've been there since. Yeah. Now I, I, you don't have to, you know, year by year tell us everything but happened. But in, in those early years as, as, uh, as Millie's assistant, what were like some of the highlights? What were the things that you just looked forward to the most? Um, well, let me think. Probably VBS. <laughs> <laughs> I loved VBS. It was so much fun. But it was, and Christmas. She used to do these programs. But I'm looking forward to probably just learning more about the Bible because, in a very selfish way, um, you have to know the lesson. So you're learning more, just like how it was for Pioneer Clubs. I was doing the same thing. And I just, I really loved like learning more about it. And yeah. just because you can read the Bible over and over again, um, and it hits you in a different spot each time. Mm. So I think just reading a story and I, like even just like the other night, um, Kimber and I were teaching on a Wednesday night and I'm like, I don't remember that. I don't remember that at all. But it was so much fun that I was teaching it again. And yeah. that that point, that part of that story stood out to me. I was like, that's wild. Like I've read that story a thousand times. I don't remember seeing that one word, you know. Yeah. So so yeah, it's always just, you know, it's, the book's alive. It's living. It always comes alive to you so in a different way every time. So it's really wild. So, so yeah, I don't know. I think just that was something I really looked forward to. I definitely worked, lived, I looked forward to working here. Mm. There is a bubble here. I don't know if I can just say that. It's a bubble. You're like living, you're working among people that you love. Even if you don't think the same, even if they have their quirks, it is just so much fun working yeah. here it it just is it always has been it always has been even with funky times weird times um it was still fun and yeah. i'm definitely i'm not a person that passively lets things bother me so i'm definitely like a vocal person yeah. like if something doesn't hit right i i never want to be like in having something like hurt my relationship with Jesus where it's like focus, I'm focusing on that more mm. than I am my relationship. So if something bothers me, I really am like definitely more, not confrontational, that's not the word, just more like I can't get this off my chest, you know, kind of girl. So I don't know, I just, I can't say I've had a bad time here, you know, like ever, I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to describe because I'm, I mean, you're talking to me, I also work here. Right? <laughs> It's so hard to describe and, um, you know, not in like a, a mean spirited way, but it's, it's sometimes really hard to get into like, um, the shoes of someone who's venting about their workplace because it's like, I'm, you're trying to listen, but like so often when I hear somebody who's, you know, venting about something, you're, you're going back in your mind to your own personal experience to find empathy for like, I, I know what I that feels like. Um, and there's very little of that, to be honest, I think. Yeah. What you said is, is true. Like, we don't all necessarily think or act alike. We have different styles. And, but even in even the smallest disagreement, there's always this feeling like we're all pulling in the same direction. 100%. And it's not like, we're not all like, it's not rainbows and butterflies. It's like you said, we don't always agree. And, and it's really a good lesson, you know, like... Um, to try other things. I'm really open to try like any, I love new, yeah. I like change, I love change. Not currently do I love change when we just moved out of our home after 30 years and that's been a, ooh, that's rough. Um, Cause I am a person that brags about change and I'm not liking this change mm. at all. Yeah. Like, I am fighting it. Like I am definitely, I'm the salmon. Is it salmon or halibut that go against the, the current? <laughs> I think it's got to be the salmon. Okay, there you sure. go. <laughs> you know when you see them and they're like going against the current and they're trying to get up? It's like, I'm that right now. I'm like going against the current. I'm like hating it. But but here, um, you know, you just realize you're, it's always a learning experience. 
Um, and it's just a beautiful story here. It just really is. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful love story because we all love Jesus and we all have a common love. So um, it's just really hard to not enjoy being here. I yeah. mean, I just, I love it here. It's like, yeah. I, I do like the, I literally am living the dream. Like I work at a church that I smile coming to. Yeah. I have a bakery I smile going to. I love my kids. I like, I just, I don't know. You know, I, it's, I'm not saying I have a perfect life. I do not. Like I have a lot of turmoil in my life, lots, but there's so much to look forward to because you have Jesus. So your end game is heaven. So you really don't like, can you really have a bad outlook on life? Like, come on. Like when I close my eyes, the last eye closing, the last breath I take, yeah. I'm going to be sitting in Jesus's presence. Like, Oh, that sounds awful. No, like never. So we, uh, so we might circle back a little bit more to, to that season, but tell us about opening a bakery. Okay. And kind of the steps that led up to that was, you know, more or less a, a hobby, something you love to do, something you love to bless people with, to now you're like literally have a door and you're in business. Okay, so I'm just on a little note. I am ADHD, probably hyperactivity, big time, right? So, no. uh-huh. <laughs> I talk really fast. I do things fast. Um, so, yeah, I'm definitely on the scale of, like, uh, I did not do well in school at all. So, I was just telling everybody, I have um, insurance that grades my driving, and it's, like, the first A-plus I've ever had, ever in my life. You're driving? Yes, it grades me. Dang. High five you for I that. I have an A plus in driving. <laughs> Anyways, the only A plus I ever got. Anyways, um, but yeah, so I did not like school. So anyway, school really, really was not my favorite thing in the whole wide world. Mm. So um, I always been very hyper. Um, so I like, and I'm creative. Um, so I love to create. So I'm going to just give you a little side note really quick. I've always baked. I've always handed um, baked goods over. I've always been the one that's baked. My sister's also. My sister also bakes. My oldest sister, out of eight of us, is sorry, Lisa. You've admitted this to me. My sister Lisa is the oldest. She does not like to cook, bake, or draw. I don't know. She just didn't get that. Mm. She's can't even draw a stick person. She said so. She is by far not creative. But anyways, every one of us are creative. So we probably fight to be creative. One thing my mom and dad did. Um, every day we had to go out in the backyard, so we would have lunch. I mean, we'd have breakfast. We had to. She kicked us out of the house. The only time we can come in is to go to the bathroom, and she said we better have to go to the bathroom, otherwise we would be working in the house. So every day we had to go in the backyard. Sometimes she would throw us like shovels or GI Joe men or bricks. We didn't use them on each other, but we had to create. So she definitely allowed us to create. So we had to create perpetually. We were creating stuff with whatever we had in the backyard. So we are all very creative. So that is my stitch. I do like to create. Um, so I've always did all of our birthday cakes, some fun, something fun, as my mom and dad did. Was it like a, a competition in creativity? Okay, so I literally, you guys, I've, I mean, all of you people that are listening to me, all one of you that are listening to me. Anyways, I am competitive. I had no idea. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just picturing I grew 100%. up in the middle of, you know, all these boys. So there's five of us in our family. But I, I just remember, like, the competition was, like, the basketball hoop, and it could turn into, like, a shoving match. I'm thinking of, like, you and all your siblings, like, competing. Here's my drawing. Let's see yours or something. Well, we're just all very competitive. Okay. It's really, and I, I'm, like, I've lied to myself for years. Like, I'm not competitive, but <laughs> Cambria. <came, came> <laughs> <laughs> I am competitive. Like, if she's cutting something, I want to cut faster and I want to get it done. I don't think I'm doing this, but I am doing it. I'm oh, literally like, done, oh gosh. done. Like, what a loser. <laughs> Waiting for the teacher to validate you, literally, but then you're like, I am the teacher. <laughs> I am literally, it's pathetic. So I definitely like to race, but I'm, I'm on a, like, side note, I'm racing myself. Yeah. I'm proving to myself that I can do it faster, and I do think I can do everything faster in my mind. So I am. And I'll tell people, like, hey, just FYI, I'm competing you. I'm competing against you right now in my mind. So I will tell people flat out that I'm trying to race and that I'm going to be better and faster, I think. Not better, but faster. <laughs> anyways, um, but okay. But anyways, me, that's the same. I started sewing. So not only was I baking, but I was also sewing. So I would sew my daughter's clothes so we can match. What a weirdo. But anyway, so I would <laughs> literally like make skirts for her, make skirts for me. So I, other people saw that. Um, in the Orange County community. Um, so a lot of people that had, were affluent, um, and so they just started asking me to do that. 
Um, so I started making like these skirts for affluent people in Laguna and Corona del Mar. And um, so I had like, that was a side job as well. So I would do that every night. And then I also did, you know, um, for like movie stars and for like sports players, their wives. And um, so, yeah, I just started word of mouth and just started doing more. I did ties, I did anything. And they would ask me and I'd say yes. I did not know how to do it, but I said yes to everything. And then you just teach yourself how to do it. Yeah, 100%. Because my dad told me, you can do anything. Yeah. And I honestly thought, well, he said I can, so I can. So I have that stuff I didn't even know how to do, and I did it. So. Yeah, you know what? Um, this is like way back at the beginning of the story, but I think people would be um, uh, just kind of interested. Talk a little bit about your dad and what he did. So when my when I was a young girl, my dad did surfboards. So my dad made Dwayne Surfboards. So that was his company, and it was um, like... Jack Davis would know this because he met my father. My dad went to him when he was um, surfing and said, here, take my board and ding it. Take it through to the pier and I'm going to show you it won't ding. And Jack was like, you're crazy. I'm not going to take a board to the pier and ding it. You know, So my dad made like this indestructible board and had this little border on it. And it would protect the board from dinging. So that was his company. Um, and then he got into, because he did fiberglass, I think he did what I did. He just, somebody asked him to do something, and he said, sure, I'll do it. And he did. So he worked for MGM, for Dick Clark, for movie stars, worked in Las Vegas for a lot of people. He worked uh, for Tom, uh, Tommy Lasorda. He had lunch with him at Charlie Brown. I went to that lunch. It was pretty cool. Um, but, yeah. My dad just worked for a lot of people. Was very, he did the, um, I don't know if you guys know, but the La Brea Tar Pits. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, he did um, this freeze. We had, um, his name was George C. Page. He was actually at our home. Um, we had lunch with him or dinner. I can't remember, but he came and met there in our very small home in Norwalk. So, yeah, my dad was just did a lot of stuff and said he could do it, and he did it. He was on a magazine cover of the Architectural Digest, um, he did like some amazing fireplace that was on the front cover, and he did a bust um, for, you know, um, Mommy Dearest. It was a true story. Uh, she was an actress. She was evil. My dad worked or uh, portrayed evil. It sounds familiar, but I, I don't. She think She was I some can... famous, yeah. Okay. And so my dad did her bust. Um, so that was like a picture of her. She wanted that in her house. Um, but anyway, yeah. So my dad did a lot of like really cool stuff and. Um, yeah, it was amazing. He was in the newspaper a lot, and yeah, it was cool. My dad was amazing. But my dad did teach us that we could do anything, and mm -hmm. so because of that, I did think I can do anything, and I did try, and I attempted to do everything and made everybody think that I could, but I probably didn't know how what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and faked it well. I did. I'm in a magazine um, with an art, with a um, music artist. It's my tie, as I should say. So, yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. So I was doing that, and so I always was doing a side job of some sort. Um, I just liked doing that. Even, and I managed my children, so I would um, take them to school. I'd be at school with them, and then we would. I'd make dinner, do their homework, and then I'd put them in the bed. And so the minute they went to bed, that's when I would start like doing my work, either making the skirts, making a shirt, whatever it was, you know. So I was already doing that, and then. I was baking just because I like baking, and people liked my baked goods. So I always baked just for people, just, you know, but, yeah. So there was that. Then I started baking for my sister-in-law with that whole group of L of Orange County women and the same group that I was doing skirts for, and then that just launched. I just did one party, and that person wanted it, and that person wanted it, and every party I was gaining more customers basically so I was in my baking now out of my home and almost the sewing was almost like a side note was taking a side note um and it was just becoming more baking and yeah so I just remember like being in my home and I was like dang I'm not a yeller I don't like that's just not my thing I'm not you know but I remember like one morning I was at my table, and all the orders were stacked up really high, and Max was super hyper, and he was, him and Bridget were, like, running around. They almost hit the table, and I remember, like, don't touch the table, and I was like, why am I yelling at my kids? Like, mm. this is not cool. Like, this is not their problem that I'm baking cupcakes out of my home, and 
I almost just yelled at them. Like, that's ridiculous. Like, I need to find somewhere to make cupcakes somewhere else, not here. And so I just remember I started looking and... Um, looking for a space. Yes, looking for a space to rent. And um, um, it was really expensive. Very, very, very expensive. And just a small little snippet, because I won't get into it, but we... I went with a friend and we were going to open a business together. It was super exciting. Um, they were really very affluent. They had, um, they had the means to invest, I should say. So we decided to open up a bakery together and then that dismantled. And I remember like just being so devastated by that because I really thought that we were going to open up this bakery and I was super excited. It was like just like everything I ever dreamed about, how I wanted it to look, like – it was just amazing. Like it was just like the greatest time, and it dismantled. And I, I don't suffer from depression. That's not my never ever. But I did. I mean, I remember like I was so sad and so devastated. I was just like I, I, I literally, you guys, I love my children. And I remember like getting the news that it was dismantling, and I was at Calvary, and I was like pulling out. And I remember like this is like so sad. I remember thinking I'm just gonna hit my. bring some tissues <laughs> I'm gonna cry. I remember I said I was gonna gas my thing and shoot across because you had to shoot across this four-lane highway and I thought I'm gonna gas it I don't care if I get hit I'm so devastated and I remember like hitting the the the, the um, driveway and I thought what am I doing like that's ridiculous like mm. give me a break like don't be such a baby like I was so mad at myself thanks thanks bestie Hey, bestie. Anyways, I remember, like, I was so mad at myself to, for even thinking that that would be okay. But I was so devastated because I really, all the plans were in. My brother went down. They decided, like, what they were going to do. Like, I, it was dismantled. Like, and for me, I think I just wanted to have a learning experience for that. I, I think I learned out of that. Like, I was devastated. I, I seriously, that day was hard. I remember... I, that day was a depressing day for me, and um, I never let that ever. Like, that will never happen again. Like, I will never be depressed like that. That's ridiculous. Like, I thought, like, it would just be easier for me just to hit across a four-lane highway and not look. Like, if I get hit, I get hit. That's ridiculous. Was it, was it kind of rooted in uh, what you felt like was a betrayal? Oh, beyond, beyond, because what they did is they took everything that I wanted and did it. You know, that was like... When I, that's what I, when I heard that they were still going to do it and they were still taking all, they didn't even, I wasn't even there. They were just investors. It was rough. You, you felt like somebody did that on purpose. Like they did all that study, all that work on you just to, just to take it from you anyways. Like that was their plan. You, you, you like, like from the beginning. Yeah. Led you on. And- yeah. Yeah. You feel that way. I don't know if that's true. I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't even go, I wouldn't even entertain that thought cause I'm, I don't need to, I'm, I'm good. But, um. But I definitely was devastated by that. But I did, I remember that night, like, thinking, like, what did I learn from that? What did I learn from that? Mm. And one thing, which brings me to this next thing, and I'll, I'll go into this next. I won't even say what I learned from it, because I'll, I'll go into that. I move fast forward three years later, and I'm still baking, but I don't want to do it anymore, because I feel like it's just not fair to the kids, you know, like, it's only a weekend thing for me, but, like, I don't want to do it out of my house, and it's too expensive to rent a space, so um, I remember my sister Lisa said, hey, Krista, they're hiring at USC, so this is where the whole God story comes in, because this is a wily, wily, wily story, I mean, it's been a God story my whole entire life, you guys, I'm so blessed, there's so many stinking miracles that have happened in my house, my life as at my house, like just me being a mom, a single mom or mom that was, you know, to an alcoholic. There's so many mir- miraculous things that happen. It's incredible. And it's amazing. But this, this will be my story for owning a business. So my sister Lisa says they're hiring at USC. It's just a part time because I was still working here. You know what I'm saying? Like it, I had like set schedules and I really loved working here. I would never want it to give this up because it's in a selfish way. You're like, you're at a home, yeah. you're working at a home a, a, with a family. It's just amazing. But I would always ask like, Hey Millie, you know, let me go. Let me go. If I'm not the right person, let me go. I'm, don't ever leave me here. Don't, don't keep me. If I'm not the right person, I'm, I'm a big girl. Like I, God has plans, you know? So, and I, 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 you know, I try to make sure that Danny knows that too, because I, I want to do what God wants me to do, right? I want what God has for me. 
But I just remember, like my sister said, hey, sis, they're hiring at USC. It's for coordinating events. And I think you do that really well. I think you should try. So I applied. There was 320 people that applied. And I got, it was down to two of us. And it was between me and another girl. So when they interviewed me, you guys, total loser. They asked me, what are the Trojans? What's their main thing? What's the main thing at USC? I had no idea. It was football. But I hate sports. So I lost that job because of that. <laughs> My sister calls me. She's like, Krista, you didn't know what USC, what's their bloodline? What's their vein? Like, And I'm like, I did not know. She's like, it's football. You said education. And I was like, I thought it was education. She's like, you lost the job. And I'm like, I lost it to an alumni, just FYI. So just, <laughs> I, didn't yeah. go, I didn't go there. Yeah. So, so either way, yeah, I messed up because I'm not into sports. Ask anybody. I'm not, I don't know anything about sports yeah. at all. Anyway, so I remember like being devastated. And I call my sister, Tressa, and I'm like, I lost the job. I'm done. I'm never, I'm done. I'm never going to bake a day. I'm, I don't care. I don't want to do anything anymore. I'm just going to focus on, you know, what God has for me. And I p- clearly not. Mm baking or working at USC. I was so devastated. I'm so sorry. I feel like I have a hair in my tooth. <laughs> Hold please. Get that hair. <laughs> we had a, we had a, a moment uh, yesterday, actually. Colton won't go down for his nap. Mm. He comes, he's like, I have something I think stuck in my teeth. And he's saying it with the <laughs> voice. You're like, you are not telling us the truth. Go in the bed. He's like, okay. Well, I do. I think I have something stuck in my teeth. And I'm like, whatever. Let me feel. So he comes over, and sure enough, he's got like a spike coming out of the back of his tooth. And I'm like, I'm so sorry, buddy. Let's get the spike out. <laughs> you're like, Dad. I know you're lying. Now I feel really bad. Yeah. That's that's a guilty. Yeah, that's where we. That's where we live. As did, did you get the hair? I did. Okay. It was something. Anyways, probably a nut. <laughs> I love my nuts. Anyways, okay. Anyway, so I call Tressa, and she's. I'm like literally. I'm having a pity party, like there's no other, like, mm. and I'm not a pity party person, but I was like, I wanted to get, give a good cry. And she was like, Krista, knock it off. I want you to go on the computer right now. Just pull up, pull up a bakeries that are closing. She goes, go on Craigslist. And so I'm like, I'm not doing that. She's all, just do what I say. Don't be a quitter. So I hung up the phone and I was like, I go, I'm not doing I remember like going like this, like, I'm not going to do it. I don't care. Like, I was like literally like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to do it. I don't care. I'm blah, 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 like that and hanging up. So I just was like not listening to her, but I was listening to her. Good old Tressa. Anyway, so I went online and lo and behold, there is a bakery that's closing two miles from my home in Lakewood. So I literally text my best friend, Tina, and I'm like, hey, Tina, you want to go check out a bakery? And she's all, yeah, let's go. Let's go check it out. Now, mind you, Tina is my sidekick. So if I have a delivery, she would go do it. If I had a big order, she would, like, help me wrap it. She didn't, she didn't bake. She's a softball girl, junkie, total sports fanatic. We're totally best friends. Opposites. I'm super hyper. She's super, like, sweet and just Jesus, and I'm like, ah, you know, all loud, right? Totally two different people. So she, she goes, yeah, I'll, I'll go with you. So I go and pick her up, and it's literally right around the block from her house. And I'm like, and it's going for sale for $65,000. So the bakery is just intact. So it has, we peek inside. I'm like, this is amazing. Like, it has, like, a, you know, like, the display counter. There's food literally in the display counter, right? Still food in there. But it's completely lights out. It looks like it's just like closed for the day. It doesn't, but it looks like an operating bakery. So I'm like, this is wild. And I'm like, let's call the number. So we call the number and the guy answers that owns that, that owns just that facility. So basically he's in a lease. He has to get out of it. And he, he wants to just sell his, his lease basically and what's in his building. So I call him and he said, Hey, he goes, Oh, I'm so sorry. He goes, I unfortunately just gave it to a real estate. And I'm all, Really? And he's, I go, So you won't show it to me? And he's all, I can't. I'm like, contracted with this real estate agent. And I'm like, He goes, But let me give you her number. And, and so he gives me her number and she calls me and she's all, Yeah, you know, want to meet tomorrow. And I said, Unfortunately, I'm going to a bait class. I'm going out to Las Vegas because I always was taking lessons. Like, I'm, I feel like you can never learn enough. I'll take a bake lesson right now. Like, I will always take a class. I just like it. I'll take a class for a Bible study. I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. anything just to learn more. I like it. So 
So she, um, he says this, and I said, the, I mean, the girl calls me, and she says, tomorrow, and I'm like, I'm so sorry, but I'm leaving to Henderson. I'm leaving to Las Vegas tomorrow, and I can't. And she's like, oh, well, we just put it up, and it's probably going to go fast. I'm like, is there any way you can wait till like, Monday? Like, could I see it on Monday? So I go to Henderson with Nina Danner. Go, Nina. We went um, to Las Vegas and learned a whole bunch of fun classes. We had a blast. Anyways, um, and so when I came back, called her name was Zona, Zona or whatever, met her. And I asked my brother, Mark, to be there, and my mom and dad. So they pull up, Tina's there, and my mom and dad. And they let us in, and it's a fully, a full bakery. Like, it's already in there. Like, the kitchen. And mind you, like, when we were going to open up the bakery before, a kitchen sink was like, I want to say, like, that home mechanism was like, uh, I think it was like $35,000 for that mechanism that you have, like where it's a three sink, you have the water, drainage, everything. Like that's how expensive it was just to put that in a kitchen. So I was like, just that right there is like $30,000. So, you know, he's asking for sixty five. This is amazing, right? So we're in there. We say nothing. Zona, the lady's like, you know, trying to tell us about everything. I'm not even listening to her, honestly, because I, I, I know nothing about business, you guys. Like, this is somebody owns a business I know zero about business. Anyways, I just like to bake. So we leave. My brother, the lady leaves. I said, okay, I'll call you, you know, and if you're interested. And she keeps saying numbers and times. I'm not listening to it at all. So we leave. I mean, she leaves. And my brother goes, sis, it's pretty cool. You know, it's a pretty cool thing. He goes, I, I, I don't know. Maybe just, you know, uh, think about it. So I go home. And my best friend and I are in the kitchen, I mean, in my house. And I said, hey, Tina, do you want to go in with me on this? And she's all, sure. She doesn't even bake. She's all, sure. I'm like, I was kind of just kidding, but are you serious? And she's all, yeah, I'm serious. Let's do this. I'm like, she's all, I'll be your 10%er. And I said, no, I will, you will not be my 10%er. Like, let's just split it. You know, let's, let's split it. Let's be, let's go and do this together. You know, I said, I'll do the baking. You can do the managing of everything. And she said, great. So... Then I'm like, okay, but it's $65,000. I'm like, what do you have? And she's all, I think I can get half. And I'm like, she's all, what do you have? I go, I have nothing. <laughs> she's all, you have nothing? I'm like, I have nothing. I have nothing. So, so I call my brother. I'm like, Mark, what do you think I should do? And he goes, well, call the guy and tell him you offer him 15000 Yeah, I said one five. He was asking for sixty five, right? My brother tells me to ask for fifteen. One five. Anyways, and I'm like, I'm not asking him that. That's offensive. And he's all just ask him. Don't be dumb. Just ask him. So I literally call the guy because I have his personal number. I'm not going to go through this real estate person. So I'm like, hey, would you be interested in taking 15000 He said, yeah, yeah, no. And I'm all, okay, thank you. And I hang up. So I call my brother. I'm like, yeah, he said no. And he's all, okay, well, then you counter offer him, dummy. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. I go, what do I counter offer him? Like uh, 50? And he's all, no, you counter offer him 20. I go, are you kidding me? And he said, just offer him 20. So ring a ding ding. Hi, um, would you be interested in taking 20? And he said, absolutely not. I'm not taking 20. The lowest I'll go is 30. What? Less than half. <laughs> 30? So I called my brother. I said, oh my gosh, he said 30. And he goes, tell him you'll take do 25. I go, I'm not, I'm going to take 30. I want to take 30. I want to take 30. I'm going to do 30. You know, I think yeah. we can do 30. You know, I have no money. Anyways, so I call back and he goes, tell him you're going to take 25. And so I call him and I said, can we do 25? And he goes, sure. <laughs> we got a building for the price of my best friend's Suburban. Yeah. Probably cheaper than the Suburban. <laughs> 100% cheaper than the Suburban. So I was like, I'll take it. Literally. He goes, okay. So I go, I'll call you right back. And I go, I just told him I'll take it. I have no money. I have no <laughs> money. <laughs> so I'm like, Tina, how much do you have? And she's like, I have half. So, so I said, she goes, you just get your half. So I call my brothers. I got my half. Yeah. So I got, I asked three of my siblings and they said yes. So I got 5000 from those three. And then she had her fifteen because we thought we might as well do 30 because we need 5000 probably just to you know, just an extra, just for whatever we just know, we're probably going to need more. So we both came to the table with 15,000, even though the, the, the store was 25. So I call him and so I ignore him like for 24 hours, the guy, and he calls me and he's all, Hey, listen, I don't know if you know it. He goes, were you not listening to Zona? 
And I'm all, I wasn't listening to her. And he's all, you have 24 hours to sign documents. And I'm all, why? I'm all, I don't even have the money yet. I just like, I just asked, you know, like I didn't tell him that, but in my head, I'm like, I just asked. I don't even know if these guys can get it to me like right now, you know? And he's all, just so you know, that business has been closed for 60, almost 60 days in the state of California. On the 60th day, that business has to shut down and has to shut down for six to eight months because the health department has to come in. He said, if you do this within the 60 days, you can open up that business without ever inspecting the store. That's incredible. Just turnkey. 100%. Yeah. That is very rare. No way that is 100% Jesus. I mean, how did this, we knew nothing about the timing. We knew nothing at all. So on the 28th, the 29th, on the 30th, they would have closed and we would have had to reopen up that store. We would have had to pay rent because you had to pay rent. We had to finish his lease. So we would have had to pay rent for six months without a store open at all. Yeah. But because this guy had left everything in there because he knew that would benefit the person that was going to um, buy off his lease. Wow. 100% Jesus. Yeah. Like it was cut, stopping us from having a huge amount of money loss. And we knew nothing about business. And Jesus comes in and lays out a business plan for us that we had no idea that that was going to happen. It is the most incredible Jesus story in the whole wide world. We signed. My brothers got me the money immediately. Um, I had it. She had it. And we got the lease. It was the most craziest thing. You know, just going through a bank. Not Her and I know nothing about bank, about business at all. And God guides us through it all. We get an LLC. We get like everything like that you're supposed to do, like all within before the 30th where we would have been closed. So it was just the most beautiful story in the world. And we weren't planning on opening because I already had enough business to pay for rent every month. So we were never intending to open. We were just going to do our orders on the weekends and keep the business closed. And we were, we were just going to use the, the, the bakery. Yeah. And then we were also going to rent to other people because what happened was in that time frame of trying to rent before we found this place, renting a kitchen was $75 an hour. That's impossible for a person to make money. So I said, I'd like to open it up for $20 an hour to whoever. So we put it out there and we had four other women that were bakers um, that baked in Lakewood um, and in Long Beach. And they were renting out of that back facility with us. It was so cool. Like it was just the coolest thing. Like, um, you know, I don't know, just to watch other women trying to do the same thing as I. And there was an, a couple too. They were really cool. They made um, empanadas. They were Argentinian. It was just so much fun. We just had, like, we had a food prepper in there that prepped food. I just, like, the coolest thing happening, you know, for, like, the first two months of us opening, you know, that. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, and then. So, I, just an observation, you know, the backstory, because you were saying you're, like, hanging up on your sister, saying I'm never going to bake another day in my <laughs> life. It just seems like so often in our lives the things we think of as totally dead and gone um, and so often they're the things that we hold the dearest, the closest to our heart that get damaged. And we think I'm, I'm never going back yeah. there cause it's going to hurt me are usually the things that God brings back to life and they end up being great joys. 100% because I needed that. I needed that because I really was, I was injured hardcore from the other, my, that other friendship mm -hmm. that broke from the, I mean, I was like devastated, yeah. but it, but what I was going to say, it taught me something because what happened was we opened up and we actually needed money. We needed more than just $5,000. We didn't know that. But somebody here at church said, I have an amount of money I'd like to loan you just so that you can um, launch your business. And so I'm like, I don't think we need launching. And my sister, Tress, goes, you do need launching. You need you need to get like cards. You need to get, you know, you need to start like branding your name and stuff. Mm. And you need to like get yourself out there. And we needed groceries, you know what I'm saying? Like just to fill up stuff. So anyway, so this person randomly came to us and offered her, her um, like an investment for nothing. She just had money and she wanted to help somebody that was a Christian. It's the wildest yeah. thing in the world. Yeah. The wildest thing. Because we needed that. We didn't know we needed it, but we needed it. We ended up not using all of it and we, had, and we paid her back as well. Um, and, but what a sweet heart. But with a third person, it did cause just a little bit of a, you know, like a, you now have a third person in there and they have opinions. So one thing I did learn is that um, to not care. I think I cared so much about the first bakery 
I was very opinionated. And I was like, this this is how you have to do it, though. You know what I'm saying? It was always like, this is this how it should be, though. This is how it should be. You know what I'm saying? Like, And I learned one thing is that I don't need, that doesn't need to be what mm-hmm. it needs to be. So, you know, there was just things that, that I had to bend on. And I it was very easy for me to bend because I didn't want ever to ever do that to anybody ever again. Because I felt like I needed to own you know, what happened before. And, and and it didn't, I didn't deserve that. But I still feel like, I mean, I was like, um, in my head, and it might not even have affected them like that, but in my head, I was like, it needed to be like that. Like it, you know, like it wasn't very open to ideas because they didn't, weren't bankers. All they were were investors. So it was very easy for me to say, this is how it needs to be because this is what I want it to look like, right? And that's not what dismantled us at all. That wasn't what dismantled us. But I just didn't want to do this in this one. I just, mm. I just wanted to be, I don't care. I'm just so happy I get a bake, you know? Yeah. So because of that, a lot of things didn't happen correctly, but it was okay because you learn from that and it was amazing. Like, it's just the most amazing, you know, it was great. It was great. It was a relief to just be like, I don't care. You know, I don't care. You know, like you want to change the name? Okay. Sounds good. You know what I'm saying? Cause I just, yeah. I just didn't want to fight about it. I didn't want to be right. I didn't want it, my opinion to be the only opinion because this is what I do, you know? So, mm. I I think that was like probably the best lesson ever. Just just be like, yeah, sounds great. I mean, because I can say I, that probably is not the best version of me when I was younger. Like when we would do events, I'd be like, this is the blue. Stay in the blue lane. You know, it's like that's an ugly version of me. Like I don't want to ever be that version. Like you know, it's kooky, Krista. Yeah. <laughs> like, like this is the way the party's gonna be, and you need to stick to this blue plan. Like that's ridiculous. So I don't know. It really. <laughs> It, it was just really takes re- the relationship out of it. Yes, and I feel like I learned so much from that, and that's probably not what I mean. That was for sure not what dismantled, but that's what I took from it. And I think it was like the life lesson of my life. Like, who cares what they're gonna do? Like, okay, great, I love it. You know, like everything's I love it. I love yeah. it, even if it's not gonna work. I love it. You know, because I I don't care. Who cares if it if it drops and explodes? Like. We'll get another one. We'll do another thing, you know? So I don't know. I, th- I, th- I think for, for you, I know every business is different, but I, I think you have a tremendous uh, advantage in that no matter what, at the end of the day, you're making baked goods and your baked goods rock. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I You were saying like, oh, my business kept growing word of mouth. I um, I remember last year on Colton's fourth birthday, you made him the fire truck cake and it was so awesome. Everyone mm-hmm. loved it. But when we cut into it, the neighbors were like, you ordered zucchini brown butter cake for your four-year-old? And I'm like, They're like, we literally were like, hey, do you want a piece? And people were like, no, that's okay. We don't want it. And then one it's gal clean. one gal was like, oh, I'll try a little bit. And then she literally was like going around the street. You guys got to try that cake. You got to try that cake. And I think you probably got like five or six different people ordering. I had so many people order from that party. That was the funniest thing. And it was all zucchini brown butter. I know. And I had one. Like I make other stuff. One, one gal who was like kind of like kind of shy, reserved. But like when the party was over and we were like, hey, does anybody want to take any cake home? She was like, I'll take it. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> so within an hour you went from you ordered your four-year-old a green zucchini <laughs> brown butter cake to like we gotta have that we gotta have our fix it's our lead seller so it's so good you know what's crazy too is like even with my business or with our business because it was tina and i that did it together um we didn't have to advertise anything we never advertised it was just because we knew we already had a following yeah. that we would just address that and like i said we weren't planning on opening but i mistakenly one time somebody was knocking on the door going there's a bakery in here and we were like yeah there's a bakery in here and um and i flippantly said and i shouldn't have said it i'm like yeah maybe we'll open august for i mean october 1st i flippantly said that and on, I want to say it was September like 28th, Tina goes, hey, just so you know, we're supposed to be opening August, I mean, October 1st. I'm like, oh, I was just kidding. And she's all, you can't say stuff to people and not stand by your word. I'm like, I don't think that person cared. And she's like, I think they cared. I'm like, I don't think they cared. We opened up on October 1st. Yeah. Mike called my brother and I'm like, Matt, so um, Tina thinks we're opening up on October 1st. And I'm just going to tell you right now, the bakery's brown and orange and I hate it. And he's like, okay, I'll come on out. My brother stayed with us until I want to say 4:30 on September 30th. I think that's what I don't. I don't think there's a 31 day in, in, in the September. morning. 4:30 in the morning. And 4:30 in the morning, he pulled like so much illegal stuff was happening. He pulled his truck like up on like the sidewalk. We have this huge sidewalk in front. Pulled it up, got on a ladder, and put a sign up there that said "Sugar from the Heart Dying." Like everything illegal. Like we 
it was crazy. He painted the building inside. We painted the floor because it was like like McDonald's orange and brown, right? We changed everything up. We tried to make it as like cool and hip as possible because it was literally a brown and orange cup um, cheesecake place. And we did it. We opened up on the first, I mean, no sleep, but we didn't care. But it was like the coolest thing ever because I would have never opened up. But Tina put like a gun to my head. Not she didn't, but like she was like, you said something and you better stand behind your word. And we opened up. So the craziest thing ever. And mind you, when I said, hey, Tina, we're going to open a business, but I'm still going to work at a church. So these are my hours. Like, this is how we're going to do it. And she uh, like agreed to all of it before we, I didn't do this after we agreed to it, like prior, like this is how I'd like it to be. So opening the business was going to be another leg on her because she already knew how I wanted to do my hours, you know, so because I still wanted to work here, you know, so anyways, but it worked out. It was totally Jesus. I mean, like how it's just amazing. Like it is the most amazing story because we were able to manage the bakery. I was able to still be here and never, ever like lose any sleep. And you realize like for me, it's like um, labor you start off with like only like a few people. So everything's manageable. But now we're like 12 years in and we're like at, you know, we're at 10 centimeters, you know, we're ready to give, you know what I'm saying? We're like at the maximum you can actually do in a business with just six of us working. And I don't want to, I don't want to add more. I love our small business. My, my intentions are not to be like a chain. I, I know that's really weird and that's odd um, for any business person to say, but my goal is just to bake good items and I never want to lose that you know like the ever so it's not a very entrepreneurial thing to say to people but um because you probably should branch out and do that but that's not what I want to do I, I really want to just bake and I continue baking all of our cakes you know it's not like I have this team doing it I bake the cakes you know you so give people an idea of how much you move in like a week how many cookies? How many cupcakes? Okay, so this morning I did thirty cakes. We did, I made thirty cakes this morning. I got there at and I and I decorated two cakes. So and I delivered a cake as well to Laguna Beach. So it, I'm I do a lot in the pre morning and then I do stuff. What time is that? Because people don't not a lot of people know this. Four, four. You get there at four a.m. I normally don't, but I had a lot today, so I I'm trying to manage my time because I'm helping my daughter out as well. So, um, so I'm just trying to manage my time. So that was just for me. I felt like I wouldn't be stressed out if I got there at four and got all that done. Yeah. So that was the only reason. But normally it's five. I get there at five, be, you know, between five and six on my days every morning. You listen to your podcast. Yeah. I listen to podcasts or Jesus. I have like an audio um, Bible that I listen to. It's definitely my, my quiet time has always been my quiet time with Jesus. Yeah. It's definitely my time to reflect. And I am a very hard person. And I think probably all Christians have this. We were just talking about this. Andy, you know this in one of our, um, on one of our meetings, staff meetings. But I'm very hard on myself. And I do not think I'm good. And I'm not asking for, oh, you are good. That's not me at all. This is like raw, honest to goodness, I'm never good enough. And I can really honestly talk myself into a deep grave. And I just remember Martha Ming telling me, hey, Krista, you need to put more music on. You need to put something else on. And all those voices will go away and you'll, mm. you'll hear Jesus. Yeah. And it, that literally let me hear Jesus. Like that was like the most like, like Martha, you gave me something for life. Like just the, that one thing you gave me for life. Because I literally would be like in there, like you stink, you suck. Sorry, I, I said the bad word. But anyways, you know, like I would like, you can't bake, you can't do this. Why do you own a business? Like I literally would do that every stinking morning. Like how are you going to do that cake? You said yes to something. You don't even know how to do it. Like constant because I, I say yes to everything. Like I don't know how to make half the stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I got you. And I do it. Thank God for Jesus. Cause don't ask me to do it again. Cause I'm not going to do it. I can't, I won't. I did it once. Like I'm not going to remember how I did it, <laughs> but, but yeah. So I don't know. I think that was the greatest thing ever that Martha could have given me the tidbit because it allowed me to like really, really, really go mm. deep in my faith. Yeah. And it's just like, I, you have no idea. Like I run to the shop at vibe because it's like, I get to do baking, which is like so therapeutic for me. And then I get to listen to Jesus or hear someone talk or it's just amazing. It's just, yeah. I love that time. So it's not, it's not like, Oh, you poor thing. You get up so early. It's like, I look forward to it. So I, I love it. Cause I think, um, I mean, you keep saying like, you don't know anything about business. I, I seriously doubt that's true, but I, I also think maybe the reason you're saying that is cause you're not in business to be in business. No. Yeah. I feel like uh, everything I know about you is the stuff you make. You know that it brings people together. Um, I think uh, yeah. I love every time we get a cake taking a picture of it because I, I know it's not, 
oh, Krista's going to feel so validated that her awesome cake looks good. It's mm-hmm. going to be, I bet Krista's going to see all these smiles and this singing <laughs> and know that she had a huge part in making a three-year-old's birthday. 100%. It's so wild. People will write me emails after weekends. I get, we get them all the time. Like, thank you. That was the best cake ever. Like, And I'm like, no, thank you for letting me be a part of it. That's such an honor that we get to be in somebody's life. Yeah. And it's so wild because I, this is like, just to be honest, I do not care how my cakes look. It's awful. They have to look, they have to taste good. And not, I do not, do not want to talk about, about other bakeries, but when you are looking at an image of a cake and it's phenomenal, it's probably rock hard because you can't make cakes that phenomenal with so much dressings and so much stuff on oh, it. Yeah. So you realize like, I'll order cakes from all those places because I'm like, this is the most beautiful cake in the world and I want it for my birthday. Like, I just want to buy that cake for my birthday. And then you eat it and you're like, what in the world did I just eat? Like, I'm pretty sure that was foam. You know, and you're like, how can people charge like that much money because they want it to look beautiful for a picture? So half the time I have to tell like event people like, hey, FYI, I don't care what it looks like. It has to taste good. And that's just primarily my goal is like, I you're spending a lot of money for a cake to not taste good. That seems absolutely counterintuitive. Like mm. but there are people that just want it to look good and they don't really care about the flavor. So I have to remind those people like, hey, this is what my cakes look like. They're on Instagram. Uh, so check it out. You might not like what I do because um, what's inside's way better than outside. You know, so I don't know. You know, I'm just I feel like I'm more concerned about making the cake taste good. And I do eat a lot of cake. I do eat a lot of my big goods. Yeah, I think I think um, like I've told the story many times, but I, I don't know that people listening have ever heard this story. The, the first time I ever feel like I was starting to get to know just you, we went out to lunch, you, Erica, and I. I think I had worked here for like two or three months, and it was to um, Erica is from Argentina. She wanted to take us to empanadas. And I just remember you kind of like eyeballing all the desserts in the case. And there's probably eight, ten different things. Yeah, there's like 12 or 13, but okay. And I remember you were like, um, I remember I thought I heard you wrong. Because you said, um, we'll take one of each. <laughs> and I thought, wait, what? One of each it's of what? One story. of each of all the desserts. <laughs> and it literally came out. And it was just you wanting to learn how taste combinations came together. Yes. So you wanted to literally a single bite of every single one because you wanted to know how Argentinians did dessert. True. And I remember True thinking, story. I just had one of the best lunches of my life. And where do you guys nap at this church? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is true. So we travel a lot. And I, or even ask Cambria. Cambria will know. I do this at lunchtime too. I do like dessert. And I do like love it. And I'll, if there's like three different things there, I'm like, oh, I'd like to try all of them. Because I just want to try them all. I love dessert. So yes. I, I love when we go out and you point like, um, don't order that one. You can tell that one has it came from like a box store and it's been pre-cut and here's why because I think like oh I I would have never known that you should order this one you can tell it was like made recently and here's why and it's like oh and then you eat it and you're like Krista just knows <laughs> so um Chris I have a few other things I want to talk about um a lot of kids a lot of families have been blessed by you in so many ways I could tell my side of the story but I want to hear you just talk about bait camp Gosh. Which sort of just started as like this, hey, what if we try this? And it turned into a, depending on who you ask, it turned into a, an animal all its own. It turned into the greatest week of kids' lives. It turned into just chaos, all of the above. But talk about baking camp. Okay, so, which is so funny because like my focus has always been to learn teach kids traits. So I want them to learn how to sew. I want them to know how to cook. I want them to know how to bake. I want them to know how to do a fire. Like those things I think, think are just lost arts. And I just remember like telling Danny, I really want to do a trade camp. I want to do a trade camp, you know, where they can learn like one day how to like do jewelry, one day to do leather, one day like I was like bake, you know, one day cooking, like whatever. I just wanted to be like all kinds of sewing, you know, like, and how can I do that? You know, and so that was like a lot of fun for me to think like, how can we do that? Right. And then Danny goes, hey, Krista, what if we just do a bake camp? What if we just do camp like that? And I was like, what? Like, greatest day ever like yes I want to bake with kids all day long I like to hang out with kids so now put like sugar and flour with it and butter I'm in like yes please so what's your phrase more butter more better more butter more better (laughs) (laughs) or what is it flour sugar and Jesus yeah yeah anyways no yeah more butter more better for sure um so yeah that's amazing so Danny let me do that that was the greatest thing ever because um I definitely like to create and because you do that, you have to like do 
practices, right? So I think everybody loves that I practice the batters. I mean, the recipes that we get to. Camber and I get to practice all the recipes before we even do it with the kids. And you guys get you to. You want to be around during the practice rounds. You do. You do. It's the best ever. Anyway, so that just, um, I don't know. I, I think that's like, this is the greatest thing ever. You know, because you're with children and their minds are like, and I think for me, because my mom and dad said, you can do anything. And here you're seven and you're baking out of a recipe book. And you're like, I could do this. You really want them to feel like I could do this. Mm. So I think for me, I really wanted the kids to know, okay, so you don't need a famous, you don't need a fabulous mixer. You don't need a fabulous cutter. You don't need a fabulous, you know, you just need what you have at house, at your home to be a baker. So I didn't, I, I think primarily in my first year was like, I want the kids to know that they have, they own everything in their kitchen that can make them make this. So I think my goal was for sure um, to pick recipes that they would be able to do at home and not feel like, well, but Miss Krista had a mixer and I don't have that mixer or Miss Krista had this, never. So I really wanted to bring it to a level that they would be able to like know I could do this at home. Sure. So I think that was like probably the greatest thing for me because I was like, oh, I will definitely, you know, like we're going to learn things that they're going to be able to make forever. So yeah, that was just greatest day ever. And for me too, it was like, I felt like, like, um, and I tell this to all the kids, every bait camp I say this, so forgive me for saying this, if whoever's listening, if you've been at bait camp, I feel like um, Jesus modeled um communion like food with people in every story that he taught right so there was always food involved and I felt like that was really really important and I know you don't remember this but you told me that it's really important to eat with somebody um to never eat alone because your body knows what to do with it it's actually God intended us to eat with people Mm. so I felt like this was like the perfect time to teach kids like hey listen you know there's always food involved with Jesus. And so don't forget that. Like Jesus told a story and food was involved. And I want to teach you guys how to make bread because that's what Jesus did. And you're like, this Jesus broke bread with everybody. So I think like that made me like so excited. And I felt like our leaders, like Danny and Rochelle, are like the best prime example of communion. They they invite everybody over to their home. Uh, there's always good food food and there's always good like talk about Jesus right it's like it's just this life of Jesus here present time you know it's just the most beautiful thing and I felt like I really need to tell the kids that Jesus broke bread with everybody and we're gonna break bread to get bread together as well so we're gonna learn about bread and so I felt like primarily that was something I really wanted them to learn like how to bake bread because this is something you'll always be able to do and break, you know, break with friends. You yeah. Know? So I don't know. I'll, I'll never forget. I think it was it was either the first or the second bait camp, but you taught kids pop tarts. Oh yeah. And there were some extras, and the first few parents through the door found out there was extras. <laughs> and then I remember because I was standing at the door with the microphone, and we would call out whose parent was there. Yeah. It was like parents were literally getting upset that there was no more pop tarts. <laughs> And it was like, wow, this is taking on a life of its own. The parents It's are, for the children, people. The parents now know if I show up 10 minutes early to pick up we'll my kid, they're probably going to have extras. <laughs> so I think you started making having the kids make extras so they could bring it home. Yeah. Yes, we yes. I don't want any fist fights starting we don't, over Pop-Tarts. We don't. Not over Pip-Tarts. Not over Pip-Tarts. <laughs> Not over Pop-Tarts. So I, I guess a couple final questions. But um, children's ministry, um, you're not someone's assistant. You've been the director for how long now? I can't even tell you. Um, it was after one of the um, VBSs, so it was one where um, Samantha was leading. So probably Here seven was that. years ago, or yeah. So. yeah. Yep. Um, and he asked, and I was like, "Yeah, no, definitely no." He was like, well, "Just pray about it." I'm like, "Yeah, you're looking at the wrong person." Like, I think there's somebody else, and I would love to work under them. Like I, I literally said that. that. I remember telling you, you better say yes. I just got to know you, and I'm not quite ready to like have to meet another new person. You better just say yes. <laughs> um, what, what do you just day to day, week to week? What do you What do you love the most about it? Okay, well, definitely working here, um, and then so Kimberly and I have a really, really unique relationship. So we get to like talk about it. So we debrief about every weekend, and then we de- then we talk about what the week that is to come so it's just really unique because we are literally primarily talking about children 
I'm not, I'm going to say 24 seven, but whatever that time frame would be eight, four, you know, eight by four, <laughs> you know, like that little construct, um, or eight by five, you know, saying, um, so it's just, um, I don't know. It's just amazing. It's amazing to be with children that are wide eyed and open to listening to what Jesus has for them. It's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful story. And, um, just to learn from them, there's so much to learn from them, like just to shut up and listen, it's just incredible what they have to say. And there's some things that are hilarious. Oh, yeah. Um, we do have a Bridge book, um, Bridge Kids book that uh, Cambria is creating because they say the funniest things. It's unofficial. It's unofficial for sure. I mean, we would never do that. But maybe we'll give it to you guys as a gift later when your kids are graduating from high school or yeah, college. All the quotes that we it's were quotes. Out saying. No, it's amazing. They're like, they just are so much to learn from them. It's yeah. incredible. And then just to get to know the families too. Um, it's really, yeah, it's, it's just so cool. They're all just a great investment, you know? I think the thing that, I mean, so many people have told you this, but the thing I love the most about the way you lead children's ministry is that you lead children first. Um, you know, there's so often we can fall into the temptation of like, I'm in charge of the program and you become like the coordinator who has the teachers and the curriculum. And part of your job is you have to do all of those things. But I feel like the kids are first and that is second. And that's the order that God intended. Like when you talk about children's ministry, you rarely say like, oh, in children's ministry, mm. you usually start with this child by their name. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that, um, I've told you this before, I, I think COVID was this big light that shined on people where they realized, you know what, I want to be at a place where my children are known. Mm. Um and I think so many people had, you know, maybe tried different places. And this is not a knock on anywhere, but so many families that landed here and their children love it. They love it because you've created a, a culture where the first thing is that you know my child. I, I go to check my kids in and I'm like, I don't even know who these parents are and their kids, but you know them all by name. Mm. Uh, and they know you by name. And it's just so, it's so cool that they're, they're just known. Yeah. Kids are just known. You can see how they play. They play free. They ask questions. They ask them freely because they know like I'm safe. Yeah. And I can, I can be me. Yeah. They're amazing. Kids are amazing. Yeah. They are the most, it's incredible. They're incredible. It's, it's an absolute gift that we get to work with them. It really is 100%. No lie. Um, and you want to get to know them. Like, this is your, this is not a business. This is the life of Jesus here yeah. walking on earth, right? Like, mm -hmm. you are, you're with them, and they're so sweet. I mean, they're feisty, but so am I. So I can love it. Like, give me the naughty ones. Oh, my gosh. They're my favorite. Like, I want to sit on the table with you, too. I, I was just telling you, one of my favorite things that you do during the bait camp is that maybe some of the kids who, you know, are acting out or misbehaving, instead of, like, getting a punishment, what they get is, I need you to be my personal assistant today. I love that because you're like, oh man, this, this kid's clearly, you know, causing some issues at the table or they're having difficulty listening. And instead of like, you better shape up, it's, uh, oh, you get to be my personal assistant. They have the energy to keep up with me. I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that kid leaves instead of thinking like, man, I can't behave. Nobody likes me. I don't fit. They leave thinking like, Miss Krista likes me. She likes me so much. I got to be the personal assistant. I can bake. I can do it. I'm wanted. And I think that's a message maybe kids don't get. I love yeah. that. I, I got to tell you something really quick. I'm Shout out to Millie. I remember having this boy in my, when we were in choir clubs. And I, mind you, I didn't teach him, but I would have to teach sometimes because you have to teach the class. Um, just so you know those kids, right? So I'd ask, can I teach one of the classes with the teachers? So I can get to know the teacher, mm -hmm. see what they're teaching, and then also get to know the child, right? And so one kid was just like, no lie. I was like, this kid's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. And I remember like going to Millie, I'm like, Millie, he's going to kill me. I swear he's going to kill me. And she's like, Krista, you love him the most. And I remember going home and praying for that child and thinking, I love him the most. 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 And guess what? I did love him the most. He was phenomenal. We became like, like I, I couldn't get enough of him. And it's just his uh, inappropriate. Like he was so like naughty, so naughty, so, 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 so naughty. Like just never paying attention to anything. Like I was under the table, like always hitting somebody. Like he was just so, but I loved him. Like he just, I just realized like, those are the ones that need the most love probably, you know, like as yeah. I was that person, right? Like I was always getting in trouble. I mean, my teacher would tell me like, hey, Krista, you're talking. 
so much like out front like in front of everybody like during elementary you need to sit up here next to me and then my mom would get the note like okay so we had to move Krista towards me today like she had to sit in front with me because she was talking too much and then she just started talking to me so I have to move her to the back again so like <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was that kid, you know, so I think I really, I love, you know, I love them all. The sweet ones, the naughty ones, the obedient ones, like just all of them. They're just, they offer something, every one of them offers something different and I can learn from it. So I don't know. It's just pretty amazing. It's amazing. So mm -hmm. anyways. The last thing I wanted to ask you about is um, as of, I guess, last month, August, um, you became... I can't not laugh because I've been calling you every grandma name I possibly so know. So mean. <laughs> it's not mean, Krista. It's from a place of love. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? So, Krista, you're a grandma. I am a Jima. I am a Jima. And how, how has that been? It is wild because when I was a mom, I couldn't wait for the next day because you just want to get through it, right? You're trying right. to survive. So you are like... I can hardly wait for tomorrow. I can hardly wait till they're in kindergarten. I can hardly wait till they're in first grade. I can hardly wait till they're in eighth grade. I can hardly, like you say that. I, for me, that's what I was saying. And it's so wild to hold a baby and say, I just want today. I don't want tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like, can you just stay here? Like, because it's done. My kids are all old now. And I pushed for that, right? Like, I just could hardly wait. Because you are like on sink or swim kind of mode, right? Yeah. So you're like, if I can just get them to kindergarten, then they're like at school. You know, like, you know, like my investment, not my investment wasn't only till kindergarten, but that's your like nonstop 24 hours. There is zero break. Like you're like in the middle of the night, like I have to go pee. And you're like with them, right? You're like, you never really get a break. Right. But you, now they're in kindergarten. You're like, I have three days. I have three hours to myself. What am I going to do? I think I'm just going to eat popcorn. You know, like I'm going to eat something without having somebody's chair, you know? Um, so that for me is really wild because I hold Coda and I'm like, don't grow up. Don't grow up. You know, like it's, it's a trap. <laughs> and it's a lie. But so I think that's what's really wild to me is because I never want him to grow another day. Yeah. Where with, as a mom, I was like, just could hardly wait to get, just get past that day mm -hmm. and, and do it. Like I, we survived, you know, like they're all asleep. Nobody beat in their pants, you know. Like, <laughs> I don't know if you ever had this, but sometimes I have that, uh, Natalie as well, where you, you just finally get to the end of the day and you exhale and you put your feet up and then you're like, man, I miss him. Like I'll catch Natalie, like falling asleep in the bed with Colton. Like he's already asleep. I used to tell everybody, I'm just dying for my child to be asleep. And then they're sleeping, like, I'm just dying for them to be awake. To be awake, yeah. It's the wildest thing. Yeah. Like, you're just, like, staring. I'm like, when are you going to wake up? When are you going to wake up? When are you going to look at me? Like, when are you going to smile? It's it's crazy. It's the craziest thing in the world. It's so funny. Like, baby's napping, and it's like, when's he going to wake up? I miss him. Mm -hmm. I miss him. I want to see him. And then he's awake, and you're like, oh, man, he doesn't sit still. He's just crazy. Or they don't stop talking. Do you remember, like, going on your first day with Natalie without the baby? Yeah. Is it, like, the wildest thing? Because you're like... I wonder what he's doing right now. I wonder what they're doing right now. Like you're literally, you can't, I, for me, I couldn't even like, I, I wasn't enjoying myself. Cause I was like, I just wanted to hurry and get back. But I knew my mom and dad were like, you have a date. So like the first hour was like, I wonder what they're doing right now. You're well, like, 100%, yeah. you're like, and then you're like, okay, wait a minute. Can we just go to the movies? How about we just have some French fries with or some chips and queso? You know, like, let me just eat. <laughs> like, yeah, I can remember a time like catching, like eating really fast. And then like, oh, I also remember a time we went to a wedding and it was like, it wasn't like we don't trust grandma and grandpa. It was just like, um, you know, it's 21st century now. So you can check your baby monitor from your cell phone. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, there's like a pause or, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. And you're waiting in line. You're like, I'm going to look at him. You know, <laughs> just look at him. I wish I had that back then because literally we'd been like this the whole time at dinner. Oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not even paying attention to Or you're to just each like other. laughing at the audio of like, man, yeah, a two year old really can take advantage of grandma pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, that would have been epic to have like a screen back then, but yeah, we didn't. Yeah. It's a mystery. You know, I was uh, thinking as we wrap up, Krista, I've been trying to share something and, and just pray and consider a, a verse for every person. And um, I feel like there's so many things I could say about you. I feel like we've developed way beyond work. We're just like good friends. Um, and I love chatting with you. I feel like there's so many things. You're creative. You're joyful. But I think um, maybe in talking for, you know, going on two hours now, 
I think people will realize maybe um, there's a resilience about you that's maybe deeper than people mm -hmm. recognize. Sometimes I think we see like joyful people or we see people who, um, like you said, you calm on top but frantically swimming underneath. But we only see the calm on top. <laughs> and maybe we're guilty of assuming things like, oh, I bet they haven't seen adversity in life or maybe they've had it easy. And that's not true of you. Mm -hmm. I was thinking and... Um, I had taught this during midweek, maybe three or four months ago, and I thought about it for you. This is um, literally Psalm 1. It's the first thing the psalmist My wants people psalms. to know. But it says, Blessed is the one who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law uh, they meditate day and night. This is the part that I, I was thinking about for you. They are like the tree that's planted by streams of living water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that they do, they prosper. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about um, that word prosper because sometimes we read that and we think like, oh, everything's going to go well for me. But I don't think it's um, everything's going to go well. It's no matter what happens, it's well with me because the source that I'm drawing life from doesn't dry up and it's not myself. Mm -hmm. And I think... Um, as we've had this conversation, I was kind of hoping it would play out this way because I think what people could take from it is, man, maybe the Krista I thought I knew, I didn't realize when I see her on a Wednesday night that she's been up since four in the morning working really hard <laughs> and she still shows up and loves my child and knows them by name. And the way that she does that is not because you're just full of energy. It's because you know who God is mm -hmm. and because you know who he is, you know who you are. And I, I love that about you. I love that you do stage designs and you do creative things. But at, at the core is you just know who you are. I think maybe more than anyone on the church staff, you also know who you, you're not. Mm. You're very quick to say like, you know, that's not going to be a good fit for me. It's, I, I'm out on that one, but I'd like to offer this. Um, and I love that about you. I feel like I've learned a lot about just being comfortable with who I am and not trying to be um, something that I'm not. And so I just wanted to leave that with you. Thank you. The last thing we always do is if there's something that you feel like you would want to say to someone. Um, I usually think of a younger person who's um, maybe experienced some of the ups and downs of following Jesus. Uh, what would you want to just leave with maybe a, a young woman or a young man? Well, I have two things real quick. Um, I think that if you are a person that um, never really, that you feel like you're not good enough or you don't, you can't especially for younger kids, for sure, or even college students. I'm not good at school. I'm not good at this. I'm not, I'm just, school's not my thing. Um, find the thing that is, because I did not do good in school. I do not have a degree, and I own a business. So I feel like, and they say, like, there's, like, a percentage, and I, I want to say it's, like, 65% of people that own business are have hyperactivity. They're ADHD of some sort because they can multitask. So I feel like, just because I, I easily could have thought, like, man, I am so stupid. Like, in which I did think. I was like, man, I am so stupid. Like, I just cannot do this. I can't catch it. I'm not getting it. I don't understand this. It's just not mm. me. But I love sewing. And I love cooking. I love these things. I, I love art. I'll draw all day. You know, like, I can write a, a poem, you know. Like, I feel like, um, don't give up. Because I feel like I knew that I couldn't do that, but I could do other things. So don't give up. I feel like if you think that you're just not smart enough to do anything in life, you're lying. That's just not true. That's a lie from the mm -hmm. devil. You can. There's something in you that can that you have that God's given you that will that you can give to others, like to be a blessing to others. So just keep that in mind for sure. And for people that have adversary, advers adversities is that the word? Like, <laughs> I think I'm not I'm sure. Like varsity. Uh, Anyways, well, adversities. Yeah. Yes, people that have like you know I, that is. Um, that's just a stepping stone to get closer to God, I think. You know, like, I'm not saying let's stay in a state of chaos, but nothing's perfect. Is anything perfect? There's always a problem, right? There's always something bad that happens. And that's just your way of communing with God even more so because um, life's not pretty. And so if you think you can do it on your own, it, you're going to be very lonely and possibly depressed because you can't do it alone. I mean, and God knows what he gave you. I think Jordan Peterson said, I, I really, I feel like this is, could be true that he doesn't, God doesn't give you anything that you can't handle. And it, because he created us to handle all these adversary, adversary, whatever, all these problems in life. He's, you know, like he's not giving them to you because he's like, oh, this is going to wreck her. 
Yeah. That's not what he's doing, you know. So um, I think that, um, you know, have hope. Yeah. You know, have hope, have a lot of it. Um, you know, I was thinking about this when we, our first day at the shop was on August 29th when we walked in there, we had the keys and somebody gave us a Jesus calling book. And I was, I pulled this out cause I wanted to read it real quick. And it was wild that this was, um, this is what, um, they had, this was the scripture for that day that was given to us in that book. And it said this, and he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, hang on, sorry, I'm such a baby when it comes to Jesus. <laughs> You guys, I do cry a lot when it comes to Jesus because I do. I, it is an awe, an awe thing when you realize that God gets you through so much because yeah. I have so much more to my story. But you can't do it without Jesus. So, so I'm sorry I'm crying. Mm. And Andy's a stud because he's... <laughs> He does this all the time. He doesn't cry. Anyways, he tells stories about Jesus. But I am like a baby because when it comes to Jesus, I'm really insensitive. I don't cry very often. And so, but with this, it does. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither soar. Sorry. They neither sow nor reap. They neither storehouse nor barn. Um, they neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of your life? If then you are not able to do a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? And then it said, "Commit your works to the Lord, and your plans will be established." That was our scripture. That. Mm -mm. so I felt like we were going to commit our work to the Lord and our plans were going to be established and that was in Proverbs and the first one was in Luke so I felt like wow we're supposed to be here like this is supposed to be our bakery yeah yeah and you're using it for his glory still 100 yeah. percent we have a prayer box and people leave prayer there for us to pray for them it's incredible yeah. we have people that come in and say can i talk to max i just want him to pray for me not get a cupcake i love that like yeah. wow you have trust in us to pray for you that's amazing so mm -hmm. it's more than just a bakery yeah yeah it's uh what god has given you and you're giving it back to him yeah Awesome. Well, Krista, thanks for uh, coming on. I hope it wasn't uh, too stressful on you. <laughs> I only started shaking when we were in delay. <laughs> oh, you're good. But I, I really appreciate um, the time, and um, I'm sure that this is going to be a huge blessing to a lot of people. So when season two comes out, um, I'll put information about your bakery and stuff in the YouTube description, and if people want to check you're so it out, sweet. they can. But, um, <laughs> we'll you. sign off here. Thank you. Thank you, Andy Dandy. <laughs> <laughs>